Honourable Members, the President. Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should all live as those social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society, bless this Legislative Council now assembled to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the well-being and good order of society in Western Australia, that all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role for which they have been chosen, and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory the honour of Her Majesty and the continued benefit of the people of this state. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This House acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajak Noongar people, and pays its respects to their elders both past and present. Members, are there any petitions? Are there any statements by ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Are there any papers for tabling? Are there any notices of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? The Honourable Colin de Grasser. Thanks, uh, President. I give notice at the next sitting of the House I will move that this House A notes with concern the ongoing issues with skilled worker shortages and the lack of equitable small business support. B discuss the, discusses the need for better planning, leadership and strategies to provide long-term solutions and address the immediate issues facing Western Australian businesses and industry sectors. And C calls on the Ministers for Commerce, Regional Development, Small Business, Finance and State Development to work together and proactively resolve these issues. Are there any further notices of motions? Uh, motions without notice. Uh, Western Australian Public Health System, the Honourable Yorn Sidmer. The Honourable Yorn Sidmer. Thank you very much, uh, President. I was, I was slightly. Um... So you need to move the motion. Yes, I will. Um, President, I move uh, that this House A expresses concern at the measurable decline in the capacity and performance of Western Australia's public health system. B registers its respect for the performance of the state's frontline clinical staff, despite the McGowan government's continued mismanagement of the health portfolio. C notes the lack of confidence in the Minister for Health, the Honourable Roger Cook, expressed by medical professionals and the broader community. And D acquaints the Legislative Assembly accordingly. Members, the Honourable Member has moved that motion and the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Yon Sibma. Thank you uh, again, President. Um, President, I gave notice of, of this motion on the 2nd of June, um, some two months ago. Uh, the earliest opportunity I, I had to do so at the commencement of this uh, 41st Parliament. This motion is as relevant today as it was two months ago. And I might just make the observation that sometimes there, there are strange coincidences uh, in political life. Uh, the government's recent three-day spin campaign, I think, actually underscores the substantive points embedded in this motion. Uh, it is not my intention uh, to use the limited time I have available to me uh, to canvas uh, what I think is obviously a, an exercise and obfuscation, other than to say two things. One, 
half of the amount to be invested had already been planned and announced. And the second thing is, when the Minister for Health was given the opportunity this morning in an interview with Gareth Parker on 6PR to explain the tangible benefits of this supposed reinvestment, how this money would translate into improved health services for the people of Western Australia, he was unable to provide any useful information. He was unable to describe where effectively the rubber hits the road when the public of Western Australia can anticipate an improvement from these dire circumstances. Furthermore, he said he explained his lack of knowledge away by saying effectively that he hadn't been briefed on that from the department. Now, I find that to be absolutely concerning, but it indicates perhaps that the minister's focus is not on his portfolio, and it is the people of Western Australia and indeed uh, clinical frontline staff who are paying the price for that failure. Uh, President, limb A of this motion is quite specific because one has the opportunity to observe measurable declines or deterioration in the performance of Western Australia's public health system under this minister and under this government. And I will cite uh, later in this contribution uh, three or four uh, KPIs which give an indicator of the deteriorating health of the public health system. The ones I choose uh, have chosen, uh, President, are selective, but I, I want to indicate there are a range of measures which are alarming, deeply concerning, that I will not have the time to canvass in this contribution. Uh, and, and they involve uh, blowouts in ambulance response times, uh, the proliferation of so-called code yellows by hospitals now is effectively uh, the default uh, management tool. Uh, the expansion in clinical incidents that are categorised as SAC1, SAC1, uh, which either have or could have contributed to uh, a, a serious deterioration or the, or the death of a patient or the um, proliferation of bypasses at maternity hospitals, or the problems that the government has encountered in the recruitment of clinicians. No, I have limited uh, my focus uh, to three measures and then an additional one uh, consistent with Limb B. The, the measures that I will focus on are ambulance ramping, the four-hour rule, and the elective surgery wait list. And, and even my assessment of these in the time available doesn't permit me the opportunity to delve deeper into the, catas the catastrophe, the structural deficiency that these headline figures uh, shine a light on. Um, President, if I might talk about ambulance ramping. In 2014, uh, the then Shadow Minister for Health and our Minister for Health, the Honourable Roger Cook, uh, took this view when hours of ambulances ramped hit 1,500 hours in October 2014. He said, if that's not a crisis, I don't know what is. Colleagues, there has been a deterioration year in, year out of this government, of the course of the last five years, all under the watch of the minister. In June this year, a record 5,187 hours of ambulance ramping were recorded. The average, yearly average last year was 2,130 hours. But recall the minister's remark that in 2014, 1,500 hours were indicative of a system in crisis. What then can we make of a situation where in June this year we had in excess of 5,000 hours of recorded ramping? The minister has failed here on his own measure. 
and the excuses which have been provided over the course of the last 12 months, not to explain, but to explain away the reasons for this, this, this appalling result, are not validated by any clinical uh, practitioner, are not supported by any paramedic. Instead, we seem we, have, we are witnessing victim blaming or blame shifting onto the St John Ambulance uh, Organisation. And I think that is particularly shameful, but indicative of a minister and a government who are fully yet to take responsibility for what is going on under their watch. I should also talk about the four-hour rule. Now, the four-hour rule uh, was implemented by a previous health minister, the Honourable uh, Kim Haynes, uh, back, I think, around 2008 or 2009. Now, that set uh, a threshold benchmark for patients to be seen within a hospital ED of that 85 per cent of presentations must be seen within that four-hour window. Now, now, that was not a measure which was necessarily greeted with great joy uh, by the AMA or, or a range of clinical practitioners, uh, but that became the rule. And it, it is important to recall the backdrop of dysfunction in the health port portfolio which preceded it in the years 2005 to 2008, uh, despite then Premier Jeff Gallup's claim that he would fix the health system. Uh, that was a system which was in worse shape than he even inherited it in 2005. But that was the backdrop. There was a need to improve uh, patient care and the visibility and the triaging in hospital EDs. And the four-hour rule was a blunt but a necessary tool to implement. Inevitably, meeting that 85 per cent target was difficult. When the Minister for Health of then um, uh, Kim Hames did not reach that. The now Minister, Roger Cook, Honourable Roger Cook, asked him on the 21st of October in the other place in the year 2010, since the Minister has staked his career on the implementation of the four-hour rule, will he resign as Minister if the lower target of 85 per cent is not reached? Again, here we have evidence of the current minister setting the expectations, setting the performance target, has he delivered on it or not? This is the question before us. The answer, unsurprisingly, is no. Last month, the figure across all WA public uh, emergency departments was 66 per cent. That's the average. The target is 90 per cent. Good target to have, but you're not meeting it. However, when you look closer, the situation is even more dire. Only 49 per cent of emergency patients at Royal Perth Hospital were seen within four hours in June, worse than when the rule was introduced 12 years ago. Apparently it was 53 per cent at St John of God uh, Midland Public Hospital, 57 per cent at Joondalup Health Campus and 58 per cent at both Fiona Stanley Hospital and Charlie Gardner's. This was from June. Demonstrably, demonstrably worse than 85 per cent. If that was the target upon which no minister can fall, or if they do fall, it's on pain of their own resignation, what should the Honourable Roger Cook do right now? I'll put it to you. There has also been, over the course of this government, an expansion in the number of people on the elective surgery waiting list. In March 2017, uh, when this government was first swept to power, there were a total of 19,931 patients on the elective surgery waiting list. The most recent uh, figures that I have at my disposal uh, correspond to June of this year, where there were 30,132 patients 
on the list. That's a representation of more than 10,000 people or a 50 per cent loading over the course of the last five years. Now, it's important to recognise that there was a spike of delayed um, surgical procedures which were consequential of COVID-19. But that spike has come back down and that aberration is now basically at the level of the long-term trend line. So what I'm saying to you is that all things remaining equal, the elective surgery wait list in Western Australia is likely to increase another 50 per cent at this rate by the end of this government's term in office. So after two terms, you will have doubled the elective surgery wait list in Western Australia. This cannot be explained away because of COVID. Quite the contrary. President, Part B of this motion reaffirms, uh, I hope, this chamber's support and esteem uh, for the frontline clinicians who, de who deal day in, day out with this level of dysfunction. I'd make the observation that these people are lions led by donkeys. I think there is no other apt categorisation. How well are they being treated? I think they're being treated abysmally poorly. And this is not necessarily an issue of ministerial responsibility, although ultimately everything within a portfolio is the responsibility of the minister, but also some seriously problematic managerial problems. And this is exemplified in the number of staff within our health services who have excessive leave booked. I've been tracking this issue across the public sector for the last five years, after the Premier himself put it on the public agenda, effectively for the purposes of managing a financial liability. But I, every six months, ask a question of all agencies, and it's basically tell me how many FDEs and at what cost uh, your, your staff uh, leave liabilities for annual leave loadings. And I'll pretty much discount anyone who's got four or five weeks owing to them, that's normal. What I take an interest in is where you have organisations where you have people take, have eight weeks or more leave accrued, annual leave accrued, and it hasn't been taken. That metric is significantly more pronounced and problematic across the health services. Very briefly, um, in December 2018, across the North Metropolitan Health Service, South Metropolitan Health Service, East Metro Health Service, uh, WAX, Child and Adolescent Health Service, and I threw Path West in, 9,494 staff had leave loadings of eight weeks or greater at a cost of $207 million. That was in 2018. December 2018. At December 2020, which are the latest figures I have, I don't have the ones from June, there'd been a 24% growth in the number of staff with eight weeks of leave, annual leave owed to them or greater than that. The point where there are now 11,810 people at a total liability of over $261 million. And that is more than two thirds of excessive, what I'd call excessive leave owed to people across the entire WA public sector. So you have a serious problem in health and it has not materialised overnight. Like success, failure in a complex system can take years and years of inattention and incapacity to deliver. And indeed, unfortunately, it has been. The question before us implicitly is, is this minister up to the job? In my personal estimation, clearly he is not. In the public's estimation, clearly he is not. All you have to do is read letters to the editor or listen to a talkback segment. 
In the eyes of the media, the minister is considered to be an articulate, thoughtful, affable fellow. And I don't disagree with any of those character assessments. This is not about character, however, it is about performance. He is not now considered to be the star potentially he once was considered to be, because the evidence is irrefutable as it is damning. Perhaps it is a matter of focus. Perhaps the minister does not have his full attention on his brief where he should have it. He had a view on how previous health ministers should conduct themselves. His view was that they should dedicate themselves to the health portfolio to the exclusion of everything else. I say once again, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. But just to reaffirm the message, when there was a change in minister under the Barnett government, from the Honourable Kim Hames to the Honourable John Day, uh, the now minister made this observation, and it's, uh, it's included in a media article from Jessica Strutt of the 14th of January 2016. And he said this. Opposition health spokesman Roger Cook said they had long been calling for a health minister who only held the one portfolio when the reshuffle provided an opportunity for that to occur. Currently, we have a minister who on one day might be sampling truffles and on the next day failing to fix our health system, he said. Our health portfolio is in a dreadful state, so we need to have a health minister focused on the job who can get in and make our hospitals work better. 100 per cent agree with that. If you want to avoid the charge of hypocrisy in political life, you sometimes need to walk the talk. So brazen, so direct was the Honourable Minister when he was the opposition spokesman that he would call for a minister's head at the drop of a hat or make very, very clear uh, uh, assessments on how that portfolio should be managed. He has forgotten all of that. Somehow, these metrics do not apply. I don't have much time left other than to say this. The government, including the minister and the premier, have jumped from excuse to excuse over the last three months, trying to explain away the situation. It is a situation which has materialised because the government has not had attention on the health portfolio for the last four years. It is inattentive. It has presided over structural weaknesses. And you cannot come here and say that the public is to blame because the number of uh, emergency department presentations is exceptionally high. That is factually wrong. The new president of the AMA smacked the government down when they tried to run that line the other day. There is a difference in the number of clinical presentations uh, now as compared to a comparable part of 2019. We're actually at a 2 per cent lower presentation level. President, the government campaigned on a mantra at the recent election. Keeping WA strong and safe, or safe and strong, was the refrain. That was undergirded by an implicit assertion that the health system was fine. Never have a public in Western Australia been more deliberately misled than that claim. We are neither safe nor strong. The Western Australian public health system is in a state of disrepair and dysfunction, and it is your fault. Fix it. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Colin de Grosser. Thank you, President. This excellent motion as moved by my colleague, the Honourable Jorn Sibmer, uh, and uh, its timeliness is still very relevant even though uh, this motion was first listed back in June. And I just want to focus on what this government said when they came to power in 2017. And when, uh, when they came to power in 2017, the government uh, commissioned a sustainable health review, a sustainable health review. And in 2019, when the minister accepted the report from that sustainable health review, he stated that demand for health services in Western Australia has grown substantially over the past 20 years as the population has grown and aged and the incidence of chronic disease, obesity and mental health conditions has risen. And he went on to say that it's time to plan for the future. Time to plan for the future. 
Uh, it's time at the King Edward Memorial Hospital served the Western Australian community well for more than 100 years, and it's time to think about the next 100 years. And what's happened? What's happened four years after commissioning that report? What's happened two years after the release of that report? Uh, our health system is in crisis. It has gone backwards from there. Uh, and, is, uh, and is looking in peril and action is urgently needed. Now, I will uh, range over some of the issues that uh, my colleague has already uh, spoken about. I think it's important to reinforce some of those statistics, some of those numbers and some of those pressure points in our health system because they are critical. They are critical and they are urgently requiring, uh, the, they urgently need to be addressed. In a recent report uh, on uh, the of government services statistics, Western Australia has the lowest number of available public beds per thousand head of population. And we've talked about ambulance ramping. We've talked about the uh, more than 5,000 hours for the month of June that ambulances were ramped in Western Australia. Uh, and in July, in July this year, uh, in July this year, ambulances were ramped for three, over 3,700 hours. That is the highest figure for the month of July on record. And coincidentally, on the 11th of August 2015, exactly six years ago today, in the other place, in the other place, the Premier, now Premier, then opposition leader said, however, there's been a thousand hours of ambulance ramping since the beginning of July. The ban on ramping has broken. So much for the ban on ramping. The Minister banned ambulance ramping However, there's been a flood of ambulance ramping. In other words, the minister has no answers. He does not know how to resolve it. In the month of July, when there was ambulance ramping, he wasn't around. Now, members, that's six years ago today. Six years ago today, the Premier, the today's Premier, the, the Honourable Mark McGowan, is quoted as saying exactly this, that a thousand hours of ambulance ramping is unacceptable for the month of July. Well, we've had 3,700 hours uh, in July in the most recent figures for July this year, and that is absolutely unacceptable. If 1,000 hours is unacceptable, 3,700 is a crisis. Uh, and of course, 99 hours of ambulance ramping in that month was actually in our regional, in our regional hospitals, and, uh, and that is unprecedented. It is unprecedented. It is unprecedented that St John's Ambulance also has priorities uh, that they can't meet for their response times because those ambulances are stuck at an ED. Their response time target of 90 per cent for priority one emergency calls uh, is, is 15 minutes, but they've been unable to meet this target for any month in 2021 and haven't met it since August 2020. How is that acceptable? On March the 24th, the CEO of St John Ambulance, Michelle Fife, told uh, 6PR, we have been delivering this ambulance service for this state for over 100 years and we've never been in this sort of situation and we've never been under this much pressure. So for more than 13 months, this government has consistently recorded ramping figures of above 1,030 hours, which uh, as shadow for health, the Honourable Roger Cook described as a crisis. He described it as a crisis when he was in opposition. These terrible ramping figures uh, that have occurred here, of course, have occurred with very little, well, no community COVID or flu. So how have they occurred? How has this happened? How, what did our beleaguered health minister say back then uh, on the 11th of August 2015 in that very same debate in that place that shall not be named? Uh, he said, he said, by any measure, the health system is in crisis. There are record ambulance ramping figures, uh, more people on the elective surgery wait list. Uh, so that is what he said in 2015. Was he predicting his own future as health minister six years ago, uh, where figures are far worse, far worse than when he was in opposition, and yet uh, the government fails to address these issues? And of course, that crisis in ambulance re uh, response times is now having a, a much more broad and dangerous flow on effect in our community. Because those ambulances are trapped out the front of emergency departments, uh, they can't get to, to emergencies out in the community. So only 79% of priority one calls were responded to within 15 minutes in June. 
And in the case of priority two and three uh, calls, they were well short. Uh, that's 67 and 63 per cent meeting the uh, response time. Not good enough. If we look at the emergency departments themselves and the targets they have uh, and aren't meeting, WA's public hospitals have been unable to meet their own target of, of uh, treating emergency department patients within four hours, as my, my, my colleague, the Honourable Jorn Sibma, has, has talked about this. The state's monthly average uh, was reported this week as slipping to its worst level for at least a year. So all of these things add up to a system in crisis and a minister who is not coping. Uh, we're experiencing record code yellows, which were once, uh, once a rare occurrence, but now uh, a very common occurrence. Our elective surgery waiting list is blowing out. Staff are unable to take leave. Uh, as the Honourable Jorn Sibmas said, over 11,800 workers with, uh, with eight weeks of leave. That's a third of the workforce. Uh, and this is under, under a Labor government, a government who is supposed to be there for the workers of our state. It should not be the case that a world-class health system is reporting 519 incidents that have or could have caused serious harm or death uh, because of improper health care provision last financial year. 142 of those incidents attributed to improper health care provisions in 2019-20, uh, which is totally unacceptable for the Minister for Health to be scathing the previous government in 2012-13 in when there were 309 incidents and then oversee a 68 per cent under his watch, among everything else uh, that he's seen increase uh, under his watch, how can, he, uh, how can he still be the Minister for Health? We heard this year, of course, about issues in our maternity hospitals. Um, when the state's leading maternity, maternity hospital went on bypass because they were short of midwives. Why? Why did our health minister at the time, why did he say, or what did he say, to allay expectant mothers' concerns at that time when, when our state's leading maternity hospital was on bypass. He said those wanting to have their baby in a specific hospital should use the private system. Uh, he suggested that diverting expecting mothers at 30 weeks was, and I quote, part and parcel of having a baby in the public system. Well, I would argue that that is only the case if you're having a baby in a broken public health system, which is the system, unfortunately, we have here in Western Australia. And let's talk more broadly now about some of the other aspects of our health system that, uh, that this failing minister has overseen, and they include many breaches uh, of COVID-19 protocols. So we've had three COVID-19 protocol breaches since April. At Royal Perth Hospital on the 18th of April, on the 4th of July at Geraldton Hospital, an incident which saw over 50 regional residents, including health staff, forced to self-isolate and put even more pressure on a health service that is already under pressure in the Midwest. On July 27th at Fiona Stanley Hospital, there was another incident. And what stuns me and what the government really should be absolutely ashamed of is that every single one of those serious breaches was the result of staff entering a lift immediately after it was used to transport COVID-19 positive patients. How does that happen? How hard is it to enforce those protocols? We need to know what those protocols are and what the government has put in place uh, to prevent those incidents from ever happening again. Uh, and we need to know why they have failed in the first place uh, to prevent those incidents from happening. Why was that protocol not followed? Why wasn't it followed? Uh, it's also concerning that uh, there are stories of healthcare workers and aged care workers unable to access COVID-19 vaccinations, and yet the government has promised to make it available to all frontline workers. Um, we have a review the government has completed into the incident at Geraldton Hospital. Um, we haven't seen the findings of that. Uh, I would welcome those findings being made public. It is in everyone's interest. Uh, to get across what exactly happened there so it never happens again. Uh, and I think it's important that, uh, that we, we all have an opportunity to scrutinise such reviews. The uh, Glossop review, of course, into hotel uh, ventilation occurred earlier this year, and that re report identified a number of 
hotels which were not fit for purpose for hotel quarantine. It recommended that uh, COVID-19 positive people not be kept directly opposite others, but that was ignored. The government sat on the findings of, those review, of that review for months, only making it public after press pressure came on from, uh, from the opposition and from the media. Um, the government have been talking about their commitment to increase uh, recruitment, to uh, increase nurses, uh, but we don't really have a clear time frame and detail on, what, on when that plan will actually be enacted, when the pressure will come off of our frontline workers, uh, and why has it taken so long uh, for these, these uh, proposals to be delivered or to be even talked about. In 2015, I want to refer to another quote uh, from the, the uh, now Premier, from the now Premier, and he said, and I agree with him, the Minister for Health should resign. It is time for the Minister go, to go. It is clear to everyone in this House that there has been an extraordinary number of failures in the health system. The Minister is half-hearted. He doesn't care. He treats it all as a joke. And that was 2015, six years ago, predicting, I think, his own health minister, who's been in the job of health for a very long time uh, as shadow and now as minister. I want to turn to the second part of the motion a little bit and talk about the, uh, the staff and our frontline health staff. And I think it's uh, absolutely right that we acknowledge the extraordinary work they are doing under the tremendous pressures they are facing because of the failures of this government. No one could disagree that, uh, that they've all been under tremendous pressure throughout the, the COVID crisis. But in addition to that, the failings in our health portfolio in this state have added a tremendous extra pressure uh, to them, a pressure that they should not be facing. And that is why we don't need a part-time Minister for Health. We do not need a part-time Minister for Health. And I agree, again, with the then Opposition Leader, now Premier, um, that he would have a standalone Minister for Health. And again, six years ago today, what did he say? What did he say? He said, I made a commitment that in government we will have a standalone Minister for Health. We will have a Minister who is devoted to health and whose only job is health. That is what this government should do, rather than take this half-hearted approach to one of the most important jobs in Western Australia. That was what Mark McGowan said in 2015, on August the 11th, six years ago today. And yet it is absolutely clear, absolutely clear that this commitment, unambiguous as it was, unequivocal, uh, has not been delivered and the government have absolutely failed in to deliver a promise they actually made uh, to have a full-time health minister. That is an abject failure on the part of this government and on the part of our Premier who made that commitment to the people of Western Australia in 2015. Uh, and he has broken in the process of not having a minister focused on our health system, he has broken our health system and as a consequence of that, so many good people in our health system are broken as well. And that is never acceptable, never acceptable. We haven't seen uh, the crisis in mental health addressed. We haven't seen ambulance ramping addressed. All of these things that they were talking about in opposition have not been fixed and have indeed got worse. And our frontline health staff, who put their, who work tirelessly, do not uh, have the opportunity to take leave, even as we've found out, uh, and, and working in incredibly challenging circumstances to provide the best health care they can with uh, very limited resources, uh, still do what they do to try and keep Western Australians safe and to try and help those uh, at their time of critical need. And, uh, you know, I, I actually want to take the opportunity now to acknowledge all of those people and thank them for the work they do. Uh, and even under the extreme pressure they face at the moment, it is critically important that we acknowledge the hard work um, of our health, uh, frontline health staff under tremendous pressure, under tremendous pressure. Uh, you know, I have many friends who work in the health system, and I know how difficult it is. I've spoken to many of them over the years 
about how things are going for them, and it is a huge challenge. It is a very, very difficult time to, uh, to work in the health system. It is a time for change. It is a time to make our health system uh, better. And it is a time to fix the broken mess that this government has created. And so all of, to all of those people in our health system, uh, we on this side of the chamber won't rest, won't rest as long as this issue continues. We will continue to fight to ensure that our health system receives the funding, receives the staffing and receives the commitment from government uh, from a dedicated health minister. Uh, we will continue to fight for that for as long as uh, we possibly can until it happens. Now, our economy is at, the, at, a, at a, you know, one of the, it is the strongest in the country. The Premier said on the 15th of April that it is the envy of the world. And WA jobs will always be the number one priority for this government. Uh, we're on track for a budget surplus of around $5 billion. $5 billion. And yet we are failing to deliver a world-class health system. Failing to deliver a world-class health system. It is all about priorities, and that is the problem. This government has got its priorities wrong. Got its priorities wrong. It hasn't prioritised health, despite the minister in opposition pledging to, promise, to fix the health system, despite the premier, when he was opposition leader, pledging to have a full-time minister for health. This government has failed to prioritise our health system, uh, and even other issues that the government hasn't prioritised. We've had the devastating fires at Wooroloo, but we haven't had an inquiry. No inquiry into that. I think uh, the Yarloop fires, there was an inquiry within weeks announced, and yet we haven't got an inquiry into the Wooroloo fires. We've got four and a half years of inaction by a part-time health minister, and yet we come into this place and the Attorney-General can fill up the notice paper with all sorts of different legislation and clearly get his agenda through why can't the health minister uh, why can't the health minister have the same influence and the same ability to get his uh, his priorities addressed um, we've got electoral reform now sitting apparently right up the top of the agenda ahead of issues like our health system it does not make any sense to me uh, an issue not even on the agenda before the election apparently uh, now takes priority We've got the lowest vaccination rates in the nation for COVID, and yet the priorities of this government are elsewhere. Are elsewhere. And so I, uh, I say, and I said before, I agreed with what the uh, then opposition leader said uh, in 2015 on this day, and that is that the health minister should resign, and it is time for him to go. It is time for this government to have a full-time health minister, a full-time health minister who can dedicate his time to addressing the many issues across the health portfolio in this state at a time when our state uh, is prospering and has done very well on the COVID front. I agree that, uh, uh, that the government has done a good job in keeping COVID out of this state. We can't blame COVID for the problems in the health system. We can't blame increased demand for uh, our emergency departments, the demand has gone up marginally, 13 per cent in four years, marginally. And yet, and yet our ambulance ramping figures have gone up uh, nearly 400 per cent in the same time. So we can't be sitting here blaming other things. We need a government and a minister that is willing to accept responsibility for the problems he has created in this portfolio, and a government who is willing to actually address the issues to address those issues. So, members, I commend this excellent motion to the House and I encourage members to support it. Uh, the Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. President, I rise uh, this afternoon to respond to this ridiculous motion oh. on behalf of the opposition. What a stunt. Oh. I have to say I'm deeply disappointed in the Honourable Jorn Sibma, who's normally one of my favourite contributors from the, the, from the opposition side. This is plain and simply a stunt. Now, the Honourable, and, and indeed the Honourable colleague Russell, I don't mind as a, as a reasonable bloke normally too. Oh. However, their contributions today were shameful. Absolutely shameful, and I'm going to point that out. And I'm going to remind people exactly what this government is doing. But I might start off on COVID-19. 
Now, everybody, including these wonderful school kids who are here today visiting Parliament, and you're very welcome this afternoon, would know we've had a, a set of, an extraordinary 18 months with COVID-19, not only in Western Australia and Australia, but indeed around the world. And the thing about COVID-19 is that there hasn't been a rule book on a shelf that you can pull off and say, oh, we've got a pandemic to deal with, a once in 100 year pandemic to deal with. This is what we do. This is what we do to keep people alive. This is what we do to keep people in jobs. This is what we do, do to keep society safe and strong. No. And so the Honourable Col de Grosse in his contribution today spoke about COVID-19 breaches. Well, what he failed to mention was COVID-19 full stop. What an own goal. What an own goal. This minister, this minister, Minister Cook, the Minister for Health, has helped keep Western Australia safe and strong for the last four years. And certainly over the last 18 months, every hour of the day, I dare say, this weighs heavily on his mind. He has been working incredibly hard to keep us all safe in this state, to keep our systems uh, ongoing so that we can live the life that we do in Western Australia. And it's very important to remind ourselves, yes, we've had tragedy in Western Australia over the past 18 months. We've had nine terrible deaths in this state, and my heart goes out to those people and indeed those families who've died as a result of COVID-19. We also had about 1,059 people with COVID-19. But that compares to 820. 20 deaths in Victoria and 21,041 cases in Victoria, 87 deaths in New South Wales and about 11,500 people with COVID-19. And then there's the rest of the world where millions of people have died as a result of COVID-19. Well, millions of people have got sick and died as a result of COVID-19. That is extraordinary. So what's the minister been doing? The minister has been keeping us safe. He has been keeping our health system going in Western Australia to keep us all well, safe and healthy. Now, the fact is, though, last year what we saw with COVID-19 was we saw people stay at home. And quite rightly so. We saw people stay in their house. We didn't want them leaving their house. We want them to stay in safe. In my last portfolio on disability, we, we saw extraordinary scenes because we had people with disability not wanting service providers in their house for fear of dying or getting sick. We had service providers not wanting their staff to go into people's houses for fear of their staff getting unwell and potentially dying. And so we saw the same in the health system. People stayed home. But what we've seen since then, as, and as a result of people not actually seeing their GPs during that time, we have seen people present now who are sicker, who are more unwell and who are staying in the system longer than they ever have before. That is a fact and that is one of the downsides, one of the many downsides that we've had from COVID-19. Now what are we doing in this state in relation to health? And I'm very, very pleased and I think the Honourable Bjorn Sidman may have suggested that perhaps a stunt or something that we've been doing this week where we've actually been announcing what is in the budget in relation to health. But to be honest and be plain, this is nothing to do with your motion. So, you know, nothing to do with your motion and to suggest it might be is ludicrous. We are making a massive $1.9 billion additional investment into health across Western Australia as part of this budget. $960 million of that is for WA Health to address what is unprecedented demand in the health system, and that includes 332 additional extra beds and more frontline staff at WA hospitals. We are also spending hundreds of millions of dollars more, in fact, $495 million more on mental health services in this state. And it's been my pleasure as Minister for Mental Health to be out involved in announcing those. And that includes about $300 million more of services in the community community services that will help target and assist the missing middle, those who've long needed services and haven't had them before. We're also spending money on graduate nurses, midwives and health infrastructure. And we continue to deliver on the commitments that we made in relation to the election in the health and mental health space right across Western Australia, including in regional Western Australia. And again, it was my pleasure the other day to announce about $15 million for a new step-up, step-down mental health facility in Port Hedland. But it's not just Port Hedland benefiting, right around this state, regional communities, regional communities right around this state and towns are getting benefits. We're spending more, we're providing more funding to the Royal Flying Doctor Service, so they're receiving $10.9 million for aircraft upgrades. We're spending $71.6 million to employ more doctors, nurses and midwives across the WA health system. 
And the, the, uh, the additional investment will see about 100 extra doctors and about 500 extra nurses working on our hospital wards, as well as about 1,000 or 1,100 new graduate nurses this year and 1,200 uh, new nurses and graduate nurses next year. There's also money to boost the existing national and international recruitment campaign to lure professionals to work and live in Western Australia. And of course, another downside of COVID-19 has been that many of the visiting health professionals who've long come to Western Australia as part of their, their journey in the health, uh, in their, 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 their jobs in the health system have come to Western Australia. But of course, with COVID-19, with borders closed, we don't have those people coming to Western Australia anymore. And in fact, many who are in Western Australia uh, left as soon as, as, soon as COVID-19 hit because they wanted to go back to their own families overseas uh, around the world. And I'm, I am aware of a group of Irish doctors uh, who went back to Ireland very early in the piece to help uh, people in their own country, uh, but who, uh, who uh, some are considering coming back to this state at the moment. I'm trying to find the points that were made just so I can uh, address them. Uh, because this has got me a little bit animated this morning. It's just outrageous to suggest, outrageous to suggest that this Minister for Health, who has been working incredibly hard, as I've said, over the last 18 months, but indeed the last four years, and has kept us safe and strong, is being attacked. It's being attacked by people on the far side who are far too cynical and who are seeking to play uh, you know, petty games and seeking to, to, to point score on things that shouldn't be point scored on. Now, I will make the point that ED, ED, you've had your go and I sat listen, I've listened in silence. I only have 12 minutes 42 left. I won't be taking interjections. You get, you get, you get a right of reply, I think, so you get to, to have a say at the end. But ED, emergency department attendance, has grown by almost 14 per cent for January to June this year, for example, compared to the same period last year. And most of that growth was in Category 2 or 3 presentations. We've seen, um, so we've seen Metro ED attendances up by 7 per cent in the past three years. That's about an extra thousand dollars, an extra thousand people per week who are attending our EDs. You compare uh, the, the financial year 21, where there were 696,000 attendances, to, to financial year 18, where there were 652,000. We've seen the presentation, as I said, up 13 per cent the past year. Uh, we've seen higher acuity. We've seen emergency department triage, uh, triage one, up 10 per cent compared to three years ago. Triage two, up 15 per cent. Triage three, up 10 per cent. Statewide emergency department attendances were 1.1 million last year. That is significant, and it continues to grow. In the mental health portfolio, we're seeing more presentations of people who were unwell, and those presentations have gone up 11.4 per cent in the past three years. Mental health patients, too, are spending longer in emergency departments. And of course, as we all know, emergency departments aren't the best place to be when you are mentally unwell. And so I'm very pleased to announce today, with the Minister for, uh, for Health down in Aurelia, a new facility, a new community, uh, a community unit down there that will help people transition from long-stay acute mental health beds back into the community. And this $25 million investment will mean that 20 new, uh, 20 new beds, 20 residents will live in this centre uh, over the next few months and it will help them journey back into, uh, into uh, ordinary life and help them get mentally healthy again. I do want to make the point though, we, there's, there's been conversations about ambulance ramping, but we aren't orphans in this regard and it's happening right across Australia at the moment. And in fact, I've heard the, mental, the Minister for Health talk about uh, South Australia, for example, where they've been, uh, they've been using taxis. So par paramedics have been putting patients into taxis and they've been sending them to GP clinics so they didn't, so they didn't have to go to emergency departments because of the pressure they're under. Everyone is under pressure at the moment. COVID-19 has a, been a big, big part of that pressure. So the health spending. So annual spending on health has increased by more than $1.1 billion per year, or 13% between 2016-17 and 2020-21. That's a, to around $10 billion in 2020-2021. Um, health spending is almost one third of government expenditure, an additional $1.5 billion of further spending on health has been approved since the 2021 uh, budget, which includes the COVID-19 WA recovery plan and key WA health system priority initiatives. 
We consistently, as a state, so Western Australia consistently, as a state, spends more money per capita on public hospitals than any other state. It's 18 per cent higher than the national average at $3,362 per person, and that's based on the most recent analysis from the, the Productivity Commission. The other point to make, and as, as I think the, the Minister for Health has made in the last few days, and you'll hear again over the next uh, few months and years, is we've set aside almost $1.8 billion for the development and construction of a new women's and babies hospital within the Queen Elizabeth II Medical Centre. And I'll pause for a moment. I want to take the opportunity to congratulate my sister-in-law, Josie Jans Dawson, and my brother, Cormac Dawson, who had a baby boy this morning oh. at 10 past eight. Uh, nice, healthy baby. No name yet. Uh, so here. Very excited. Very excited for the here, two of them. Um, and I think some of you might know Josie from her days as a netballer and indeed playing at uh, working at the Wirrapunda Foundation. Fantastic couple, and I wish them every joy and hopefully uh, many hours of sleep. So uh, and they had their serve, they had their, um, they, the, the baby was had in the, the labour suite at King Edward Memorial Hospital this morning. Everything went well, went well. the staff were great and it's, a, it's an opportunity I guess to pause again and to thank those wonderful staff that we mm -hmm. have in our health system in Western Australia. You can't downplay the work that they do and it's been more and more challenging. It gets more challenging uh, as we deal with more mental health issues but it's particularly been challenging over the past 18 months as we've dealt with COVID-19. So thank you to each and every one of those and congratulations to Cormac and Josie. Now, what else have we been doing? So there's more money being spent. Uh, we're investing more than $1 billion over the next four years into health infrastructure. And that includes for major hospital redevelopments and expansions across the state. They include the Joondalup Health Campus, the Fremantle Hospital, Bunbury Regional Hospital, Peel Health Campus, Geraldton Health Campus, Laverton Hospital, Tom Price Hospital, Newman Health Service, and more. And in fact, Mika Thara Hospital is on the list too, right across the state. And you'll note, and honourable members who represent the regions in this place will note the abundance of health service uh, funding that is going into health infrastructure in regional Western Australia, because we're dedicated to ensuring that regional Western Australians benefit as well as, as, as people in the city, and that all of us in Western Australia can have a quality health care that we can uh, uh, access as close to home as possible. Now there will be further, there will be further uh, announcements over coming days, and indeed in the lead up to the sep September the 9th. But we can be very proud of that investment, a significant $1.9 billion investment into the mental health system, uh, into the health system in Western Australia. Now, I did want to tackle the, the, the point the Honourable Jorn Sibber made about excessive leave balances. And again, I want to ask the Honourable Member, where has he been for the last 18 months? Where have you been for COVID-19? Because what COVID-19 has done, it has meant that work hours have increased for workers in the mental health system, but it's also, there's also been added restrictions on, on the availability or the ability of staff to take leave over the pandemic period. It has been all hands on deck. We have asked of our, of our public health professionals and staff for them to contribute, for them to help us keep people safe in Western Australia, and they have come forward. But what it's meant is they haven't been able to take leave. And in fact, many of us haven't taken leave. Ordinarily, some of us would go overseas and, uh, and, 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 and have fun or interstate, and of course, that hasn't happened. People have been working in the health system and they haven't been able to take that leave. But again, I want to thank them for their commitment, for their commitment to, health, to mental health and to health in this state. Now, I was making the point earlier about our challenges in, in WA being not exclusive uh, to this state, because hospitals all over Australia are reporting similar difficulties. As I said, public hospitals are treating more acutely unwell patients, often with complex conditions, including increased mental health uh, patients and older adult patients with increasing rates of chronic disease. Paediatric demand is also high. We're seeing increased presentations and wait times in EDs and increased lengths of stay at hospitals. And as I indicated earlier, so ED, ED attendances grew by 14%, and that's massive. I think the Honourable Colin de Gross in his contribution earlier on uh, talked about a 13% increase and, and that not being anything. That is substantial. That is substantial. Any increase in the health system is substantial. But in anything in the order of 10, 13, 14 per cent is massive. It puts more pressure on the system and it makes those workers have to work harder. And as I said, that people are coming in with more complex, uh, complex conditions and more acutely unwell. However, 
Despite these problems, our staff continue to provide exemplary care. And for the best part of the, of the past year, we have led the nation in our Western Australian emergency target performance, also known as the four-hour rule. The past month has seen a decline in our um, Western Australian emergency target performance. The ongoing impacts, though, of COVID-19, including the requirement to isolate patients with respiratory symptoms, including the use of protective, personal protective equipment, but also the additional cleaning requirements and staffing shortages in the context of increased activity in EDs are reportedly having significant impacts on patient flows. But the current system pressures are complex and multifactorial. And to suggest for some, you know, as, as has been suggested, that the, the, the Minister for Health is sitting in an office dreaming this stuff up is preposterous. Is preposterous. He has been working every hour of the day to make sure that we have quality health services in this state, but also that we as a state are actually dealing with COVID-19. And I think we can be incredibly proud in Western Australia of our government, of the leadership of the Premier and the Minister for Health, because they have protected us. And the proof is in the pudding. One only has to look at the evidence from around Australia and indeed around the world about how people have been suffering, ill, unwell as a result of COVID-19. Yet extraordinarily, the whole team working together in Western Australia has limited, has limited the effects here. Now, the uh, nursing and midwifery was touched on. There has been a 49.65 per cent increase in the overall number of graduate positions in transition to practice programs offered in 2020 and 2021. Health service providers, uh, this is a creation of the former government, have been actively recruiting to address nursing and midwif midwifery shortages, and that's resulted in a 6 per cent FTE increase of registered nurses and enrolled nurses employed across WA Health between January and June this year. And as a result of the immediate remediation strategy to address the current nursing and midwifery shortages, the Western Australian Department of Health has enabled an increase, an increase in graduate positions across HSPs. So 982 uh, newly qualified nurses and midwives have been onboarded this year, with a further 100 uh, enrolled nurses to be recruited and onboarded as part of the McGowan election commitment. And this will total about 1,082 uh, graduates across the system by the end of 2021. The number of RNs and ENs have also increased by 1,376 from June 2020 to June 2021, and this equates to an increase of about 8%. All the HSPs have confirmed that they have recruit, recruitment strategies in place to attract experienced nurses back into the clinical setting. And these include, but are not limited to, nursing and midwifery positions advertised locally on WA Jobs Board, nationally and indeed internationally, uh, targeting the United Kingdom and New Zealand by the individual HSPs. The utilisation of talent acquisition through the individual health services centralised process to review and exhaust all possible offers to candidates in recruitment pools, support with onboarding and pre-employment checks, particularly for vaccines in critical areas of needs, and the amendments to job description forms to attract a wider pool of applicants. For example, moving the requirement for recent paediatric experience for paediatric nurse positions in the child and adolescent health service, and including a strategy to, to offer upskilling through a newly developed program. And this has resulted in the employment of 134 nurses, of which 107 are now participating in paediatric upskilling program. Look, I could go on for a long time. I could talk about the infrastructure. I could talk about maternity services. I could talk about regional health and the investment. I could talk about country ambulance services. But can I say, this motion today is outrageous. Outrageous. And, I, 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 and I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that someone like the Honourable Jorn Sidmer would seek to play politics on an issue like this, an issue so dear to every Western Australian. And I'm shocked too that the Honourable Member has just glossed, particularly over the last 18 months, and particularly COVID-19, and particularly how this government and this Minister for Health has dealt with COVID-19, has kept this state safe and strong. Outrageous. We will not be supporting this motion this afternoon. The question is that the motion be agreed. Uh, the Honourable Brian Walker. Uh, thank you, Acting President. I speak to you today not as a parliamentarian, but as a service provider. I do believe I'm the only qualified service provider in this House. Probably medical service provider. Having said that, you're quite right. Now, 
one of the things which you have to notice, and I'm not going to take any particular side, because the points that are brought up today are valid on both sides. They're also both wrong. We actually don't have a health service, we have a sickness service. And the reason we have that is because we are focusing on the disease and not on the causes. And this results, if you're going to put things into a nutshell, this results in an inefficient service which spends money. At the moment, costs are increasing. This is evident, costs are increasing. But the benefits to the population are decreasing proportionately. Now, as anyone here who has run a business will understand, if costs are increasing and the benefits are decreasing, that business must surely fail. The current response that we see in government is to throw more money at the problem without addressing the cause. Now, I speak to this as a non-partisan participant, as a health service provider. So I'm not going to criticise anyone, because everyone who has been making a decision has been making it possibly not from the point of view of those who actually provide the service. Let me give you an analogy of the type of people that are working in this service. On a personal level, last year, when COVID hit, I would travel out from my family in Perth, and I would drive out to my location in Cunnanopin, where I would then have to deal with the issues regarding COVID. At that time, we had no idea. There was a 10% mortality rate reported. There was all kinds of chaos being reported. The information we got from the health service was actually miserable because they didn't know themselves. They were, as the Honourable Minister has pointed out, also tapping in the dark. I, however, had to make a decision because I was the only doctor in the area, covering a fairly large area, 150, 200 square kilometres, farming area. And under those conditions, with a health service volunteers, running the ambulance. We couldn't transport people who were predicted to be so sick. They would come to our hospital. We had one ventilator, a nice Hamilton. I loved that ventilator, but only one. And we had this knowledge that those who were over 65 were going to be very difficult to resuscitate. So I made the decision, in the absence of any support from the health department, I made the decision that if there were to be two patients there, one over 65 and one under 65, we will treat the under 65 preferentially. And that, I said to the staff, includes me. If I fall sick, you will not ventilate me. So every day when I drove out, every week when I drove out to my practice, it, I did so in the, possible, in the knowledge of the possibility that I may never see my family again. Let that sink in. I went out to serve the population at the possible risk to my life. And I would put it to you that most of our health service providers are the same. We sacrifice ourselves for our patients. So thank you for the respect shown. But one thing is also shared by our health service providers, and that is we would almost universally like to execute every single health bureaucrat existing. Not a single one would we leave alive because of what they have done to us. They have demotivated, de-skilled, and demoralized, and disrespected the health service professionals, universally. Let me give you an example. The nurses in a hospital where I worked were told they were not allowed to sit down on their eight or 10 hour shift. The managers who did that were sitting, sipping their lattes in the office, but the nurses weren't allowed to sit down. And if they protested, a lot of them were on four, five, seven visas, they would be deported back to their homelands. Bullying. I remember very well a case of an elderly lady who fell and fractured her pelvis. And the nursing staff was fantastic. We got the specialist approval at a distance. Uh, X-rays were done in my hospital. And it was a fractured pelvis. It's painful. You have to move. And rather than accepting the extreme professionalism of the nurses, the administrators said, oh, this could possibly be fatal for the patient. This is a, a SAC-1, as mentioned implying that there was negligence of some sort. The nurses were uh, angry and, again, demoralised. They expected this. I was furious, of course. 
put my word in, put the fear of God into the administrators, there will be a coronial and you will be named because they had actually taken action which put that patient's life at danger. But they would not admit it. This is what happens. The health service staff catch the blame and we back in the head office, we blame you and no one can touch us. We like to kill them all. The service itself is run by bureaucrats. We have the example not so long ago in Midland Hospital where the service was cut by $10 million and they blithely told the world, yes, we'll cut $10 million off, we'll cut some staff, there will be no loss at the front line. Utter idiocy. That wasn't a government from either side. That was the health service bureaucrats. Clueless, careless, inefficient, managing a system poorly. But they're managing it the only way they know how. There has to be a rethink. And I'd put this to both sides of the house. I have to look at our health minister just now. And I've, I've heard the points on both sides. And I have to say, if I were in that position as a health service professional, I don't think I could do any better. I would challenge anyone to do any better. It's like the yes minister comedies. You're in your office there, it's the administration behind which makes it so very difficult. But also the laws that we make which make it so very difficult for us to move forward. I mentioned earlier one of the ways of managing the budget is to cut the staff. But you cannot say we've cut the staff because that would mean that we're actually hurting people. No. The bureaucrats say we have reduced the full-time equivalent. And because of that full-time equivalent, we can only manage so many beds. So in the hospital where I was working, there were unoccupied beds because they'd cut the staff. But they didn't say that. They said, no, the full-time equivalents are there, and these are the beds which are apportioned to that number of full-time equivalents. They cut the service. But they, they, it wasn't a lie. They simply altered the wording. And so now people are climbing into the hospital saying we need to be treated and they can't be treated because we haven't got the staff. And so the staff are running twice as fast to deal with the same number of patients because the FTEs have been cut. And is anyone wondering why the staff are exhausted, demoralised and wishing to retire and resign? It's not the government problem. It's the way it has been organised as a sickness service. And this is carried on because that's what we learned from the 1960s, 50s, 40s, 30s. This has been a long time in coming. But the more successful we have become, the more people are living, the more complex the disease is, the more work we have to do. And so money has been chucked at the problem, but the cause has not been dealt with. Let me give you a medical example. Someone comes to me with a headache and says, I've got a headache, had it for the last 10 years. No one can fix it. I'm taking Panadine Fort, I'm taking Tramadol, I'm taking all these painkillers, and the headache is still there. I am probably one of the first people to properly examine that person, and I find they've got what's called cervical syndrome. The neck there, the muscles there have to hold up the head. And if they're under pain, if they're strained, another muscle there causes pain going into the eyebrows and gives you a classical headache around there like a band, the occasional sore spot, a thumping behind your eyes like a man with a hammer. Very classical pain. What's it caused by? Well, in children, iPhone or iPad. Or, if you're working at a computer, looking at your computer with an ergonomically improper chair. So let's fix that. Let's get some physiotherapy, chiropractic, and get an ergonomic chair for your work. Now, the work says, nope, not going to have that. Here's the chair. Off you go. If you can't, you've got pain, work on through, take your Panadine Fort. Oh, you're a bit slowed because of the Panadine Fort. You can't do your job. We'll sack you. Get someone else. What, I ask you then, is the cause of the headache? Is it the poor posture? Or is it the way this person has been treated? Are we better off treating the cause? Or shall we treat the effect? This happens time and time again. So what we're needing now is a system where the finances are spent more efficiently. And that requires a rethink of the whole system. In fact, a system of preventive medicine not in reactive medicine. Lifestyle, exercise, nutrition, mental health. This isn't a matter about getting more psychologists and psychiatrists. The mental health problem is not a problem of lack of healthcare professionals. It's a problem of increased mental health problems in society. Why? 
because they have been oppressed, they have been bullied, they have been cornered, they have been forced to work two or three jobs to make ends meet, because they are suffering domestic violence or homelessness, they are suffering the trauma of their childhood or whatever. Fixing these problems, remember that headache issue, let's fix the cause, not the effect. Addressing the cause will give you a lot less in the way of costs. Shall we not reconsider our approach and look at a health service which looks at preventing problems rather than allowing them to happen? Take, for example, smoking and the associated risks with cardiac health. We know very well that smoking has gone down, but so many people still continue to smoke even after they've lost a leg or suffered the second heart attack. Can we do anything to help? Can we uh, uh, do anything to empower people to take their health back into their own hands rather than going to the doctor and saying, I've got a headache, give me a pill? Which is what happens now. So what we see in the health service now is a lot of angry and exhausted healthcare professionals. We're also not helped at all by our professional bodies. The Nursing Federation, for example, when nurses complain about being bullied at work, there's very little support. Now, they might be saying, the laws are in place, the unions will look after them, but it is not the way on the ground. The nurses I have spoken to have been left abandoned. We need to strengthen, encourage people like the ANF to actually work on behalf of the nurses and not in cahoots with the management which has abused them. Bullying you may be aware, is a key feature of all health service provision places I have been employed. I have personally, at least they tried to bully me. I'll tell you a story over a beer sometime. Suffice it to say, it didn't go down very well if you fight back. But that depends on being self-secure, certain in the knowledge you don't need to get that job. If you're cowed by your employer that you may lose your, your visa to stay here, then you will be practically a slave in the system. The Australian Medical Association, nice ideas, not practical for us on the ground. The RACGP stood by helplessly. When we want to read an ECG, if you come to me, now bear in mind, I studied to be a cardiologist, and they tell me that they're no longer going to uh, pay me for the job of reading an ECG. I used to read them for the hospital, but no, you'll do this for free. How does that go down? I'll charge the patient? Really? There was a while back, I used to love putting needles into people's joints. Now, you may think me a bit geeky, but, you know, big, long needle, lo local anaesthetic, it's a lot of fun, I can tell you. You must try it sometime. But when you do that, take off the fluid, put in some steroid, wonderful for the patient. We're not going to pay for that anymore. You're going to do it under your own costs. You pay for the, the, the bits and pieces. You pay for your time. This is no longer something on Medicare. Now, we are actually held hostage to Medicare in that our patients, if they're impoverished, depend on us to do that. So if we can't do that, get, well, we can, but not get remunerated, we'll send them off to the specialist. So six weeks wait, seven, eight weeks wait, it costs more than the ultrasound comes and the specialist. So the system costs more, simply because you've tried to save money on one end. $30, I think it was, not even that. And it's costing hundreds for the same job. Who thinks this thing up? Who, who, who in the right mind would do that? And what's rubbing salt into the wound is that our taxpayer money goes to paying for that person. A little while back, we'll talk about another health minister, Kim Hames, who, when I was in Newman, every weekend, one or, once or twice, we send someone out by RFDS, $10,000, $15,000 a shot. Because we didn't have the laboratory facilities to, take, uh, to check if there was inflammation present or not, an acute abdomen coming in, if it's just a bellyache or if it's something more serious. So off they fly. The lab closed at midday on Friday, opened on Monday morning at 8. There's a machine we could use, $7,000 machine. And we could check those things. And maybe save one or two flights a weekend off to Port Hedland to get access to laboratory and specialist service. There was a man in Port Hedland doing a cost-benefit analysis of our hospital getting a $7,000 machine. 18 months later, there was still no outcome 
from that cost-benefit analysis. And I paid with my tax money. I paid his salary. He's part of it. Man, that hurt. I mentioned it to the health minister. No action was taken. When I was told we didn't even have a white cell count for people coming in with infections. Horrified. Path West, horrified. Action taken? None. That wasn't the government. It's simply the bureaucracy involved in getting things done. We're fighting against people who don't really care because they're sitting in an office, not at the front line. When that patient was brought in 12 hours after being thrown out of a vehicle at night, fractured spine, lacerations, major injuries, dying. The volunteer ambulance drivers, fantastic job. The nurses, fantastic job. The doctor, well, I can't say anything more because it's me. And then to see that person a year later, absolutely well, having been sent by RFDS into specialist care and with an excellent outcome. It fills our heart with joy. That same ED, when we wanted to deal with a mental health patient who comes in, aggressive, violent, some psychotic process, we got a sheet of paper. What do you do? How do you get help under such conditions? Small print. There's about five or seven telephone numbers to call at this time, at that time, at this. A patient's coming in shouting and screaming, and we know there's going to be no help at the end of that phone. Breaking the windows, threatening us with glass. It takes hours to deal with that. Because one case of a patient in an ambulance couldn't get him out because he was just violent, just sleeping off his, but he was violent, probably methamphetamine, called the police to help. It's remote and rural. 40 minutes for the police to arrive. Can you imagine a potentially violent patient there, just a nurse and myself, and the ambulance driver, but a man who was really very difficult to manage, 40 minutes before we can get the police to stand by that we could examine the patient and see what can we do. Bureaucracy. It's not a matter of how much money we're chucking at it, it's getting it organized. And I'm speaking to you as a health service professional, with no criticism at government whatsoever, because the work done by our current health minister I have to admire. Are there gaps? Certainly. Could I do better? I doubt it. We have to respect everyone who's doing their very, very best. But for the love of all that's holy, please let us focus, not at each other, but at the cause of what's going on, what's going down in our health service. Look at the cause. Fix the cause. Treating the effects is far more uh, expensive. Now, that's about it from me, from the health professional. I don't know how often you have heard that. In your travels, you might have spoken to the people in your different hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, the, 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 the porters, the, the, the lab staff. There's a lot that can be said. But in what I have seen, there's an immense amount of pain and suffering. The suffering of those who would sacrifice their lives for you and yet feel that they have been let down by everyone in the system. The question is that the motion be agreed. I give the call to the Honourable Kyle McGinn. I give the call to the Honourable Stephen Pratt. Acting President, uh, Minister, the Honourable Minister Dawson said that this motion is outrageous. Um, I don't disagree, but I also welcome this motion because it's important that we talk about health in this place. Now, I wanted to respond to a couple of the matters that um, the Honourable Jorn Sibma, who's on urgent parliamentary business, raised. Uh, the four-hour rule. Now, uh, it was a, a slagging fest on how the system is performing, but the fact is that the four-hour rule that was implemented by Minister Hames as a benchmark, WA has had the best performance in the country under this measure consistently over the past four years under the McGowan government. So it's, it's a bit of a stretch to say that um, we're underperforming uh, in reference to the four hour rule. He also pointed to elective surgery wait lists and wait times. And um, what we all recognise is that we've been under a, a global pandemic that um, wasn't foreseen. And the, the wait list has grown and thanks to a concerted effort by this government with a blitz on surgeries that has returned back to pre-COVID levels. So um, I'm not sure what point he was trying to make there. Um, 
so also uh, members opposite pointed to comments made by Roger Cook, who's a big focus of this motion in opposition. Uh, well, let's just say um, it's going to take more than one term to fix the mess that you left us with. Um, we started started with a bang. We, we, adopt, we adopted the Perth Children's Hospital which, uh, and fixed the lead, lead issues in the water there so that it could be opened in the first place to deliver much needed services um, to the children of Western Australia. Um, the other thing that's been failed to mention today, um, whilst Minister Dawson touched on uh, what's in the upcoming budget that's been announced so far, um, the achievements over the past four years, of which there are many. Uh, this government expanded youth health and mental health services in the Peel region in, uh, in June 2017 as an election commitment. Uh, I welcome the contribution of the Honourable Brian Walker, who would be um, very much aware that this government uh, made available prescription of med medicinal cannabis in June 2017. Um, we also uh, introduced patient opinion, which is now known as care opinion, which is a public-facing dashboard across health services, which allows patients to provide direct feedback to hospitals and have two-way communication at that, at that level. Um, we also came with a suite of um, solutions. Unlike what we heard from the opposition today, there were no solutions, just negativity and sour grapes. We, we came to government with a commitment to deliver Medi hotels and as many would know, health infrastructure doesn't happen overnight, so these fixes are ongoing. But we have opened the Royal Perth Hospital Medi Hotel. It commenced operations in August 2020 and he's been very well utilised. And I also note there's movement on the ground at the larger Murdoch Medi Hotel site within the Murdoch Health and Knowledge Precinct. We delivered the Kalgoorlie Health Campus MRI. We opened the maternity assessment unit at Osborne Park Hospital in December last year. The other thing that needs to be pointed to is that this health minister has been going from, to, from health site to health site, meeting with all the staff and um, holding staff forums across the, the last term of government and hearing firsthand what, what some of the issues are in the system and responding directly to people across the health system. I'm not sure what more you could ask from, from a health minister. Um, so I'll continue with some of the achievements and I can touch on uh, a range of infrastructure projects across the state. Um, there was the Carnarvon Renal Project, um, PCH as I mentioned, um, Geraldton uh, Regional Hospital had under, underwent a major uh, redevelopment which is ongoing, and we also opened a mental health step-up, step-down service in that area, and we had a commitment to deliver those across the state. Uh, mental health is one of the big uh, contributing factors to the demand on the uh, hospital system at the, at the moment, and these services are really playing a really important role in providing that subacute level care so that people can go somewhere uh, in a better design setting uh, and provides that supported accommodation instead of having to front up at a busy emergency department that is not the appropriate place for someone uh, with mental health uh, difficulties. So we delivered those um, in a, a range of regional areas including Bunbury and Kalgoorlie and I know there's more that are coming online um, as well as Albany. Um, at in the South Metropolitan Region, uh, at Fiona Stanley Hospital, we delivered the family hospital, uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital Family Birthing Centre. Um, and I, I think that um, if anyone gets the opportunity, they should go check it out. It's a very modern design, uh, provides a great service for uh, new families to welcome their baby into the world. And it's a truly a world-class service. And when I say world-class, Today's been about bagging uh, the performance of the health minister and the health system, uh, whilst also congratulating and thanking the, the people on the ground who do the hard work day in, day out. It's a bit of a backhanded compliment. We do have a world-class health system and we're very lucky in this state to have that. Um, 
I'll continue because we, we provided upgrades to a, a range of hospitals and um, clearly uh, a focus on uh, regional hospitals as well. So uh, we upgraded uh, some of the building at Collie Hospital, um, Harvey, uh, Southern Cross, Dalwell and Ewan Gumaling. Um, and another really large commitment of the previous government was the, the major redevelopment up at Joondalup Health Campus, which is ongoing. Um, I, could, I could probably go on all day with some of these achievements, um, but I will touch on another aspect of um, important change that the Health Minister was um, mainly responsible for in terms of legislation, which me some members of this House will be aware of. Uh, we introduced the no jab, no play policy, which is known as the Public Health uh, uh, yeah, Amendment Act, no jab, no play, um, we all, as, which was delivered in uh, 2019. And we all know now even more so how important vaccinations are. There were amendments to the Tobacco Control Amendment Bill, the introduction and passing of the voluntary assisted dying legislation, and a, a really major introduction was the WA Future Fund Amendment Bill, which created a, um, a fund that grows annually and um, will go towards future health research, commercialisation and innovation. And th the opportunities that come from that are endless. I think um, that, that will be one of the major um, outcomes that this minister is remembered for, um, should he ever choose of his own volition to leave the health portfolio behind. Um, it certainly won't be from uh, this lame motion that's been moved today. Um, so Minister Dawson touched on the recent announcement. We've got a massive $1.9 billion investment in health and mental health services coming up throughout Western Australia. And this follows the range of uh, achievements that I've, I've listed, and there were many more. Uh, so, and again, a major focus on regional communities. So, uh, one thing with uh, Western Australia is the challenge is the vast landscape of WA, uh, which means we do need to innovate. So, one of those innovations has been telehealth. And we've really ramped up the use of that, and it's become a, a um, national and international uh, solution during the COVID pandemic. Um, in terms of the, uh, the upcoming budget, uh, $19.7 million is going towards the patient assisted travel scheme, and that, that provides a really important service to patients in the regions who have to travel for healthcare. Um, it's a really difficult circumstance when you have to leave your families for surgery and um, stay down in the metro area for a period of time to recover. So that's a really important scheme and I'm glad to see we're uh, increasing our investment in that. Um, 15.7 million over the Ford estimates towards uh, Mekathara, um, which includes acute care, emergency services, mental health, community aged care and other primary care services. Um, Minister Dawson touched on the uh, 10.9 million to the Royal Flying Doctor Service, another great service that provides important um, emergency uh, health services to people in the regions. Uh, there's a $2.2 million uh, allocation to establish a women's community health service in the Peel region. Uh, another 4.4 to the WA Country Health Service for um, a range of sites for the Home and Community Care Program. 4.2 million for Narragin Regional Hospital for a dental clinic and uh, for adults. Um, Two million uh, for further planning and scoping works for stage two of this uh, previously mentioned redevelopment at Geraldton Health Campus. Yeah. So there's a range of stuff that, that is ongoing and um, it's really difficult to see how anyone could come into this place and criticise the government for their performance in health when things are new, new initiatives are happening daily 
um, where we've got a pretty ambitious infrastructure program that is ongoing. Um, and the, the Health Minister has um, just handled uh, and provided a strong leadership during a, a global um, pandemic. And the, the strong response to that has been based on the science and has been a health response. So it's, it's a really strange um, approach to take to at attack the current health minister for his performance when uh, he's just uh, basically kept us all safe with the uh, leadership of himself and, and the Premier McGowan. So very interesting uh, approach to take. One thing that um, has also not been touched on is the really large uh, allocation of funds uh, through the Meth Action Plan, and that was a $473 uh, million uh, contribution, and that provided a range of um, uh, initiatives to, uh, to combat what, what was a growing problem uh, early in the term of the last government and obviously continues to be. But um, things were um, across Australia uh, really starting to take hold and uh, the grip of meth on people was really uh, having an impact in the community. So we, we made a concerted effort, uh, the McGowan government, to um, tackle that front on. Um, some of the other mental health initiatives include uh, the acti assertive or active recovery teams, which has been, a, um, I think, a trial program in South Metro area and has had great success is being expanded um, to country in the Wheat Belt and Midwest. Um, so really important to see that work. Um, what that does is it, um, upon uh, someone with a mental health uh, attendance at a hospital, it ensures that um, those people don't leave uh, without somewhere to go, so that they have people that um, go with them and make sure that they stay engaged with the health services that are available to them in the community so that they can recover and stay well. Um, the government's also expanding the mental health police co-response program into regional areas, another program that's been uh, extremely successful. Um, so uh, the way that, that system works is that we have uh, mental health specialists in uh, vehicles with police attending to people who are in distress and um, ap approaching that situation in a manner that is um, suitable to um, provide care, a caring and um, assistive approach to people who are in dist a distressed uh, state. So it's a really important one, that one, and I'm, I'm happy to see that this government is expanding that. Um, and as I touched on, the McGowan government continues to deliver significant new investments in regional infrastructure in health, uh, including the major redevelopment that will happen at Bunbury Regional Hospital, Peel Health Campus, uh, Geraldton that I mentioned, Laverton, Tom Price and Newman, and many more as well. So uh, I'm proud to be on this side of government when we talk about our performance in, in health because we truly do have a world-class system and uh, every day hundreds of, and thousands of people go to our health services and are provided with um, great outcomes and um, I'm glad that, we can, that you've raised this motion so we can talk about the, the good performance of our health system in this place because it's often only the negative stories that are few and far between that we do here in, in the media and from the opposition. So um, I'm not sure if Minister Dawson touched on what this budget will deliver in terms of new beds, but uh, what, what the McGowan government is delivering is uh, a total of 332 extra beds, 174 of which will be new beds, um, and it, this includes um, mental health beds as well. So um, I'm really proud to see that um, that we're investing more into the health system. Um, it is worth noting that the health budget does, um, health expenditure does make up a third of our, our state's budget. So uh, it's impossible for anyone to say that health hasn't got a strong focus of this government because it, our expenditure alone 
takes up a third of the state's uh, budget. Um, uh, we've also set aside $1.8 billion for the development and construction of a new women's and babies hospital. This is a, a, a large undertaking and, um, as we know, uh, with delivery of health infrastructure, um, we can't trust uh, the Liberal opposition to deliver health projects in this state, so I hope to s that this government can see that through to fruition. Um, in terms of staffing, now that was something that was touched on by the Honourable Jorn Sibmer, and, and it is, there is pressure on people in the system, and uh, a lot of that is due to COVID and the difficulties we have in recruiting uh, people from overseas or interstate, and um, people are having to, to work longer hours as a result, I assume. So, um, in saying that, between March 2017 and the December quarter of 2020, the number of workers in the healthcare system employed by the state increased by 10.4 per cent. So it's worth noting that there was that increase over the last term of the government, according to the Public Sector Commission, and um, the increase, that increase accounts for almost half of the additional workers added to the public, public uh, sector since the McGowan government took office. So. It has been increasing, and although during the pandemic we have had uh, challenges to face. Um, so it is important to point to what is happening in the system now. There's, there is 10 per cent more ambulances than there were three years ago. Um, attendances are up. I think there's been some dispute about the percentage, but certainly in, uh, I think from June to January it's been up uh, 14 per cent. So um, that is a huge increase and it's something that um, wasn't foreseeable, so we've just got to deal uh, with that as a system and um, I think that our, our system is doing the best that it can under a difficult circumstance um, and it's, it's not an issue that's isolated to Western Australia. I think um, across the country it's the same. So, um, so one thing that um, I'll touch on is um, that people presenting at our hospitals are presenting with more complex and acute issues, especially when it comes to mental health. Um, as I mentioned, the, my understanding is that from January to June this year, um, compared to the same period in the previous year, ED attendances have grown by 14 per cent. That is large and it's a hard thing to combat um, when it is difficult to recruit recruit new staff to the system. Um, and despite these problems, our staff continue to provide exemplary care for the best part of the past year. And as I mentioned, we have led the nation with regard to the emergency access times that are, are a benchmark across the system. Um, so I, I thank uh, the Honourable Jorn Sidmer for raising this motion, uh, but it's unsurprising, I'm sure, that I disagree with every part of it, apart from the great contribution that our staff, our health staff make in the system every day. Members, uh, the question is that the motion be agreed. I'm about to give the call to the Honourable James Hayward, but just before I do that, could I just remind members that under the temporary order, we have a provision for the mover to speak in reply for not more than five minutes, and for the president or in this case the acting president to interrupt proceedings to allow for this provision so I just ask members to bear that temporary order in mind the honourable James Haywood uh, thank you thank you very much health is a big job it's a big job and uh, sure we have a world-class health system I have no doubt that that is the case and I certainly welcome some of the fantastic things that the government are doing to try to to try to meet the demand that is out there in Western Australia I don't know if anybody's driven a Tesla, but they're a pretty state-of-the-art uh, vehicle. Uh, I, I haven't had the privilege yet to, to drive one of these cars, but you can imagine it's got all of the latest things that uh, are available, that technology offers. But if you're driving down the freeway and the wheel falls off, it ceases to be a world-class piece of transport equipment. No matter that it's got all the bells and whistles and all the fancy stuff and the best of everything, if the wheels fall off, it's no longer first class. 
And the reason people over here on this side have raised this issue and the reason it's being raised in the community is because it's a real issue. And to have members say that it's, it's a lame... Uh, it's a lame motion and uh, that they're disgusted that we should raise it. I mean, come on, guys. It is a big job. The people of Western Australia expect you to perform and do a very big job. You know, if, if you're the West Coast Eagles and you're out there uh, playing, you can talk about how fantastic you all are and what a great team you've got, but at the end of the day, you'll be judged by your performance. And the performance is in, in playing footies to win the game, in running a health service, it's obviously to be able to treat uh, the patients that come forward in an appropriate yes. manner. The uh, minister said that the systems were ongoing. The people are staying longer uh, in 2021 than they ever have before. Now, I don't know if that's uh, correct. I have to take him on face value. We can ask some questions about it and presumably we'll get an answer back probably in a month to let us know. What those, uh, what those figures actually are. What we do know, what we absolutely do know, is people are staying longer in ambulances than they ever have before. That's what we do know. Uh, the reality is that the AMA are out criticising the state government. The Australian Nurses Federation are out criticising the state government. It's, it's, not, it's not just us. Uh, the reality is that you guys have underinvested in health over the term of your government. It was said that emergency presentations were 14% uh, from January to June. Well, the West Australian published yesterday. The West Australian published yesterday that, in fact the percentage had fell, fallen by 2% compared with June 2019. So we'd need to get to the bottom of those figures. So which is right? Uh, are presentations up 14%? Because the, uh, the, the Honourable Member, the, the Minister, said earlier that last year people stayed home. He said that some of the challenges in his portfolio in disability services was disabled people didn't want providers coming to our house and providers didn't want to go to people's houses. He said people stayed home. So if there are 14 per cent higher presentations at hospital this year compared to last year, well, come on, guys. People were staying home. You can't use those figures. Let's go back to 2019. The West Australian reported yesterday that basically the figures are the same and that they had dropped in the last month by 2 per cent. So, you know, we need to get to the bottom of, of, of what's right in terms of that. Beyond the smoke screens of the story, storytelling and spin, we need to understand exactly the situation that, that our health, uh, health service is in. I just want to uh, turn your thoughts to Albany Regional Hospital. One of the things that was also mentioned was that it would take more than two terms to fix the problem that the, the previous Liberal National Government had created. Well, in, Al in Albany, in 2016, the average uh, wait time for a, a, an ambulance ramping time was one hour a week in 2016, one hour a week. In 2017, in Albany, it was one hour a week. 2018 to 19, you guys were in government, no hours per week. Obviously, you did a great job there, something was going right. 2020, three hours a week. This year, he got up to 19 hours a week. That's six times the previous year and 19 times worse, 19 times worse than 2016 and 2017. So I accept all of the great work that you guys are doing. And there was a great list of tremendous things that the state is doing to try to, uh, try to help meet the need. But the reality is it's not working. So I encourage you to continue doing the things that you're doing, but more needs to be done in this space. The AMA said that uh, in relation to Albany, that obviously it needs to be, there needs to be an increase in capacity. I'm pretty sure that when the Lib Nats were in, there was a new Albany hospital built, and obviously there needs to be more investment in that place to be able to cope with the, uh, cope with the added growth. <coughs> 
Interestingly, in a newspaper article uh, about that ambulance ramping, a spokesman for the WA Country Health Service said, um, in relation to the, uh, the ramping, said that the Albany Health Campus consistently performs well. How can, how can you say that? Surely that is absolute spin. Clearly, the situation is 19 times worse than it was five years ago and six times worse than it was last year. The ambulance ramping at Albany Hospital. The other thing is that the mayor down there, Dennis Wellington, told me when I was down there meeting with him recently that there was one day where all of Albany's eight ambulances were ramped at the hospital, all eight. What that means is if there's a emergency, a vehicle accident, or somebody has a heart attack, that there is no ambulance available to go into that community. Now, I hear what you guys are saying about what a fantastic job you're doing, but the reality is, in Albany on that day, that is, is a terrible circumstance. We have to do better. The government's got to do better. The other thing you need to understand as well about Albany and all of the regional hospitals pretty much is that they don't have full-time paramedics. So you have volunteers who, who are joining St John's to go and help who are then stuck in an ambulance with their patient for hours on end waiting for the hospital to be able to take the, take the capacity. So it's not very fair on those volunteers either, and it's not a great use of the community resource. You know, there have been plenty of examples uh, this year. I note that uh, we talked about earlier that there have been nine COVID deaths, and that's uh, a, a terrible tragedy. COVID is something that is external. It's external. It's something that we have no control of. But when you have... Um, a young child passed away in a state-of-the-art children's hospital, um, you've got to be asking yourself, what is going wrong here? When you've got the, the nurses out uh, on strike saying, uh, you know, that the hospital system is in crisis, you can't just ignore that and say, oh, it's all, all smoke and mirrors, it's all, the, uh, it's all made up. And we've spoken in this, uh, in this chamber before about uh, Ashwari Asworth's uh, terrible, terrible situation, which we all agree should never have occurred, and unfortunately it did. Um, but the reality is we have to do better. It's not good enough to say, hey, look, we've got the Tesla. We can drive down the highway. We don't even hold onto the steering wheel. Well, you do in WA. But in some places it'll drive itself. That's how good it is. But if the wheels fall off, it is no longer, it is no longer a state-of-the-art vehicle and it's no longer fit for purpose. We have these things happening all over the state. We have a situation in, in Bunbury where the Bunbury Regional Hospital is under investigation by WorkSafe because of a toxic culture. And the Honourable Brian Walker talked about some of the challenges around culture within in, in the medical teams. Um, you know, that, that must be seriously concerning. One of, the, one of the difficulties is we have a full-time problem with our health service. We have a full-time problem and we have a part-time minister. And if the minister's not going to resign and let somebody who's more capable and more competent to lead the team, then at the very least, at the very least, the Premier ought to give him only responsibility for the single portfolio so that he can concentrate on that full time. We have a full time problem and a part time minister. The other thing I want to talk about briefly is the fantastic work our health people do, and, and again it was raised in debate that it's a bit of a backhanded compliment. I, I don't see that at all, at all, because the reality is, um, as we all know, particularly those of us who are parents, and I've talked about this in this chamber before, is you don't want to see, 
uh, our child up to, to fail. And the problem is, is when uh, emergency rooms and hospitals are understaffed for a little while, everybody will bust their boiler to make sure that that, that works. But when that happens over months and months and months and years, what happens is that you, you burn out that workforce. And then when that workforce is unable to meet the needs that are coming in the door, uh, that's when obviously problems occur. And when those problems occur, to then blame the staff, which is what we saw happen uh, earlier with the Perth Children's Hospital, it's, that's, that's a disgraceful way to do things. Those people turn up every day and do their absolute best. And there are a lot of great things about our health system, I'd agree with you. I think uh, uh, in some manners it is well resourced. But the problem is it is not coping with the workload that's in front of it right now. And, the, and those staff are not being supported. You know, when, when you have a team of people, like I said, they will, uh, you know, they'll give their right arm and right leg to help get you through a, a spot. But the problem is that when you take advantage of that situation or the circumstance mean that that situation is not fixed over a long period of time, it builds resentment, it makes it difficult for, uh, for that team to work and function effectively. What we really need is the state government to take its McGowan superpowers and apply them to fixing this health, uh, this health need. Now, we had previously raised issues of health before, and we were told, nothing to see here, it's all going well. Well, over the weekend, your government announced $1.9 billion of uh, new investment into the health uh, sector. $1.9 billion into the health sector. Well, obviously there's a problem. Obviously you understand that there is a problem with the, the, uh, the health service, and you can stand up here and talk about uh, all the, guess, the line items of all the money that you spend, and, and that's all very welcome, and that is the business. It is a big game, and the people of Western Australia expect you to be uh, on top of your game. And being mediocre at this stuff uh, is not going to be good enough for Western Australia. You need to be absolutely at the top of your game. Pretty hard to be at the top of your game when you're a part-time uh, when you're a, a part-time minister. Western Australia deserves a full-time minister to work and um, make sure that these issues are being dealt with at the, at the highest level and with the uh, greatest sense of urgency. So you announced $1.9 billion, which is obviously welcome, but the reality is that's an acknowledgement that there's a problem. So again, to turn up in the chamber today and uh, ridicule the opposition for uh, raising this issue when you know it's a problem is probably a, a bit disingenuous, to be honest. This is something that needs to be fixed for the people of Western Australia. It'll be a fantastic experience when that Tesla gets its wheels back on and you can jump back on the freeway and put in the cruise control and we can all move forward uh, knowing with confidence that we are going to get to the place we need to be. But right now, the wheels are falling off. And it's incumbent on the state government, it's incumbent on you to, to solve this problem for the people of Western Australia. And the only way we're going to do that is by getting a full-time health minister to fix a full-time problem. With that, I'll uh, sit down and allow the mover. Thank you, President. Uh, members, the question is that the motion be agreed. Uh, yes, you're kind of peaking 31 seconds too early, but with the uh, agreement of the House and no other member seeking the call, I give the call to the mover of the motion, the Honourable Yonson. Uh, th 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 thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I, 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 was, I was awaiting a... Um, a, a brief and witty contribution in the 30 seconds um, before I was given the opportunity to reply. Um, I, I, I'll begin my um, wrapping up with, with this observation. I, I think it's very clear uh, today that the government did not bring its A-game uh, to this debate. 
as indeed it as as as, in, as indeed it, it hasn't it has not brought its A game to the management of the public health system, which is absolutely the point. And the reason I say that is is there seems to be uh, it was it was not unexpected. We we heard this diatribe that the, the, the motion was lame, that it was opportunistic. I'm sorry, but you must be living in cloud cuckoo land if you do not think that the mismanagement of the WA public health system is not on the lips of every man and woman in this state. In the paper, on the radio, consistently there. You cannot pretend it is not an issue. You cannot pretend it is not an issue. Um, the excuses were expected. It's all COVID's fault. But there's a new line now. It seems to be the fault of the patients, the people who have the temerity to turn up and present in a clinical setting wanting treatment are the cause of all this problem. And it reminds me of that Yes Minister uh, concept of the perfect hospital, which was the one which had no patients, because that is obviously the most efficient. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're never going to get there. I'm sorry that you're never going to get there. I was also surprised, it must be said, that so much was invested in this budget uh, package. Obviously, all the details have been settled. You've been dropping this out over the course of the last three days. Why don't you actually just grow up and bring the health budget for debate here? Why wait another three or four weeks? You've obviously got it all settled. You've obviously got all the answers. You've obviously made all the decisions. Show the details. And I think the details are important because the health minister seemed to be oblivious to them when he was asked on air this morning. Mm. So who actually was responsible for drafting this health rescue package? Because it doesn't seem to have been the minister. Because he is still awaiting a briefing from the department on the matter, and I think that is absolutely telling. Okay, absolutely you telling. An indeed, indeed, and we've provided opportunities. If you want to go out and play this budget drop game weeks in advance of the actual budget coming down, and we ask, well, where's the cash flows? Where's the spins? Don't play the cute game and say, oh, it's all budget in confidence. We can't possibly tell you until the 9th of September. I'm, I think we're beyond that, uh, frankly, yeah. now. Um, there was, I was outside of the, the chamber, but I, but I did hear, um, I think, the Honourable Stephen Pratt uh, talk about uh, medi hotels, uh, maybe in Joondalup. I, I hate to say it, this is, this is, this is, this seems to be another one of the fabrications out of the health system that these projects uh, uh, will fix every problem. I haven't seen one, particularly not in Joondalup. I haven't seen one over the last few years, and I don't have any great expectation uh, that I'll be disabused of my cynicism over the next four years. But it is not a political view. It is not a political view to criticise the Health Minister's performance on the metrics he himself has set. I will conclude my contribution by citing the words of the new AMA President, uh, Dr Mark Duncan-Smith, who on the 16th of June this year said this of the health system. It's crisis with a capital C. It's a huge crisis and it's moving from crisis to crisis to crisis, he said. Crisis management is really the end of poor strategy and poor planning. That's where the government is now with their health policies. 100% agree with that assessment. I'll also talk, uh, cite uh, another, another contribution by, by Dr Mark Duncan-Smith. Um, again, reflecting on the, set, on, the, on the expectations that the current Minister for Health set his predecessors. He said this on the 12th of July. It's telling to recall what then opposition health spokesman Roger Cook had to say about the situation back in 2015. To add insult to injury, we've had every imaginable excuse now that Mr Cook is actually in a position to address the situation. The current activity was predictable and should have been planned for. This is it. This has been a slow-moving catastrophe. It hasn't been exacerbated by COVID-19, as the government alleges. I think, strangely, in a counterintuitive way, COVID-19 has pulled back a little bit. When we're sort of coming now to the stage of normalisation, we're seeing the health system for what it is. It is in a deplorable state. I commend this motion to the House. Yeah. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against, no. no.
And I think the noes have it. The divide. Ah, uh, yes, sorry, division called uh, please ring the bells. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Sorry. Thank you. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed. Members voting with the aye shall pass to the right of the chair. Members voting with the no shall pass to the left of the chair. I appoint the Honourable Colin de Grasse for the ayes and the uh, Honourable Pierre Yang for the noes. And before the teller tells, I cast my vote with the ayes. Members, the results of the division are uh, ayes 8, uh, noes 21. The question is resolved in the negative. Please return to your seats. Uh, we now move to orders of the day. So, uh, Leader of the House. Uh, I move without notice that orders of the day numbers 1 to 18 be taken after order of the day number 22. Members, uh, the Leader of the House has moved that orders of the day 1 be taken uh, to 18 be taken after order of the day uh, 22. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. And the, uh, um, I think the ayes have it. Do you have a message? Uh, I do. Uh, Honourable President, the Legislative Assembly having this day passed the Arts and Culture Trust Bill 2021 presents the same to the Legislative Council for its concurrence. Acting President, Speaking. I move that the bill contained in Legislative Assembly message number 26 be now read a first time. Uh, the Leader of the House has moved that the uh, Bill will be read for the first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. And the, I think the ayes have it. Arts and Culture Trust Bill 2021, first reading. So, Acting President, I move the bill be read a second time. I'm pleased to introduce the Arts and Culture Trust Bill 2021. Most of the state's most iconic theatres, such as His Majesty's Theatre, are managed by the Perth Theatre Trust, the PTT. The PTT has served this role for many years in accordance with the powers granted to it under the Perth Theatre Trust Act 1979, the Act. 
While the Act has done what it was designed to do, it has also restricted the PTT's potential and prevented it from moving beyond the narrow role assigned to it, which is to manage theatres. Successive governments over many years have identified the need for reform for the PTT and the management of state cultural assets. This included the 2015 Agency Expenditure Review and the earlier reviews conducted by the Public Sector Commission. The McGowan government initiated a number of reforms to ensure that the public sector is modern, high performing and maintains its ability to deliver future services to the community. While there have been some amendments to the Act over the past 40 years, these amendments were not related to comprehensive and wide-ranging reforms needed for a PTT to effectively, effectively meet current government or community needs. The McGowan government has a vision of a PTT which manages not only theatres but also cultural centres and other valuable cultural assets, a vision that cannot be achieved with the PTT in its current form. For this reason, the bill will completely replace the legislative framework under which the PTT formally operated. The PTT will be transformed into a new statutory authority known as the Arts and Culture Trust. Trust. This new authority will have greater responsibilities, broader powers and more flexibility to manage, care for and develop cultural assets for our future generations. Uh, creation of a new and modern trust. The trust will be similar to the PTT in some regards. It will be a key government arts entity. It will be a statutory authority. It will be managed by a board. It will have a list of duties and the legal powers needed to carry them out. It will be accountable to the Minister for Culture and the Arts, the Government and the Parliament. However, the Trust will also have many important differences. The most important of these reforms relates to the Trust's core functions. The Trust's responsibilities will not be limited to theatres. It will be empowered to manage all kinds of cultural venues, including outdoor spaces such as the Perth Cultural Centre. This will include state-owned assets assigned to the Trust and potentially any private owned, privately owned assets that enter into partnership with it. The Trust will also have a greater power to engage in business arrangements subject to Treasurer's approval. Many reforms in the bill relate to the board that will manage the Trust. The new Trust board will consist of nine members compared to the PTT's eight members. This will make quorums and majority decisions easier to obtain. The bill will require board members to have specific skills and experience which relate to the Trust's operations. It will also require board members to have different skills. This will ensure that the board has a broad spectrum of knowledge to draw upon. Moving to a skills-based board will no longer see almost half of the trustees nominated by the City of Perth. While this made sense in the early days of the PTT, the PTT now manages theatres in Subiaco and Albany. The new trust will reach even further and potentially be responsible for assets across the whole state. This change is not a reflection on the City of Perth in any way. It simply reflects the fact that the management of the trust is a statewide concern, not just for the City of Perth. There will also be reforms in the bill to increase the trust's accountability beyond the annual audits by the Auditor General to ensure its affairs will be transparent and beyond reproach. The trust will be subject to special safeguards, including the use of information and the disclosure of conflicts of interest. Increased partnership with arts organisations, an important provision in the bill, will allow the government to declare a state-funded arts organisation to be a resident company for the purposes of the bill. This reform will provide clarity for the relationship that exists between these designated state-funded arts organisations and the Trust. Maximising commercial potential. The bill will also grant the Trust with increased power to participate in commercial activities and business arrangements. This will provide the Trust with the ability to optimise the potential of the assets it controls, including assets which are located near major commercial and tourism hubs. An example of this role involves attracting and contracting events, activities and commercial tendencies to enliven the PCC, which uh, encourage people to visit both the PCC and the resident cultural institutions, Art Gallery of Western Australia, State Library of Western Australia and the West Australian Museum. Place activation activities include short-term events, such as the annual Fringe Festival staged in the PCC, as well as permanent or temporary food and beverage outlets. By allowing the Trust to capitalise on this potential, it will be able to maximise its resources and create flow-on benefits for local businesses around Trust property. It will also help create much-needed jobs in the cultural tourism sector, along with the hospitality and retail sectors. For accountability purposes, the bill requires the Trust to obtain the approval of the Minister and the Treasurer before entering into certain business arrangements beyond an agreed financial limit or class of arrangement. 
This will ensure that the power is used with appropriate checks and provides maximum benefit for trust operations. These business arrangements give the trust the opportunity to increase the quantity and diversity of the performances on offer at its venues. This also allows the trust to present international and national artists that would not come to Perth without the investment by the trust. Declaration of places to be venues. The PTT is currently restricted to managing the specific theatres vested in its care. The current legislative regime is restrictive and does not easily facilitate short-term events or opportunities that can arise within the cultural and artistic sector. To enable the new trust to hold artistic and cultural events to be enjoyed by the community, the bill will grant the minister with the power to declare any part of the state a venue if it is intended to be used partially or wholly as a place for cultural and artistic purposes and for any duration of time that the minister thinks is appropriate. A declaration will enable the area to be used by the new trust to hold events and provides the trust with broad powers to manage and conduct those events. This reform provides long overdue opportunity for the government through the trust to host cultural and artistic events anywhere in the state. Consolidation of the state's cultural assets. Under the current legislative regime, arts and culture assets fall under the management of the state government, including the Perth Cultural Centre and the Sunset Heritage Precinct. There is a growing argument that many of these assets should be managed by an organisation that specialises in cultural asset management. For this reason, the bill will grant the government with the power to vest any of the state's artistic and cultural assets, including public spaces, under the control of the trust. This provides a long overdue opportunity for the government. It will give the state a mechanism which it can use to consolidate cultural assets under a trust that is best placed to manage them and then to use those assets by hosting arts and cultural events to be enjoyed by the community and attract visitors to the state. Create now, enjoy later. The bill expands the previous definition of activity being only related to an event, performance or production, to include activities relating to creating works to then be enjoyed at a later date. Our experiences with COVID-19 have demonstrated more than ever that live streaming and accessing content at a convenient later time is here to stay. This provision allows for the Trust to establish, own and operate the proposed $100 million state-of-the-art screen production facility, which is a key election commitment. The facility will contain a number of purpose-built, highly sound resistant stages and other on-site facilities such as offices, construction space, parking, set storage and other amenities. The construction of the facility will create more than 580 jobs, with approximately 2,800 film production and precinct hospitality jobs supported per year for the longer term. The studios will support the creation of feature, factual and animation productions for television and cinema screens, as well as commercials, streaming and gaming. The government's commitment to this facility fills the gap that has been a major disadvantage in attracting international productions to WA. Despite our state's unique and diverse natural pristine beauty, stunning light, vast open blue skies and local talent. Showing us West Australian stories, culture and landscapes will showcase our state to the world, providing a boost for tourism. Accountability of the Trust. As a statutory authority and part of the public service, the new Trust will be accountable to the Minister, the Government and the Parliament and will be required to comply with all legislation governing the public sector. Protection of Trust property. In order for the Trust to have the ability to ensure the orderly operation of permanent and temporary trust venues, and which recognises the broader remit of the new trust. The bill will also allow the governor to make regulations on various operational matters regarding trust property. This includes management of venues, admission of people to trust property, the behaviour of people who visit trust property, consumption of liquor at trust venues, the imposition of fees, imposed, imposition of fees by the trust, and parking management on trust land. These regulations can be enforced with fines and will provide the trust with a greater ability to manage and protect the assets vested in its care. Transitional arrangements. This bill transforms the PTT into the Arts and Culture Trust. The bill includes consequential amendments to other pieces of legislation. These amendments will remove references to the PTT and replace them with references to the new trust where necessary. The bill also includes transitional provisions to allow an orderly handover of the PTT's assets, liabilities and contractual obligations. This will ensure that the transition won't compromise any pre-existing matters and, importantly, the rights of employees. If the bill is unable to provide for a transitional matter, the Governor will have the power to make regulations to deal with that matter. 
This bill provides a significant and long overdue reform to the management of cultural assets in this state. Pursuant to Standing Order 1261, I advise that this bill is not a uniform legislation bill. It does not ratify or give effect to an intergovernmental or multilateral agreement to which the government of the state is a party. Nor does this bill, by reason of its subject matter, introduce a uniform scheme or uniform laws throughout the Commonwealth. The McGowan government believes this bill will provide great benefits to our state, both now and in the future. It will ensure that this government and future governments protect and develop the cultural riches that the people of WA have entrusted to us. I commend the bill to the House and table an explanatory memorandum. Uh, members, the explanatory memorandum is tabled and the debate stands adjourned. We'll move on to order of the day 24. Uh, Public Health Amendment Safe Access Bill 2021, uh, and that's in committee. Members, the question is that Clause 1 stand as printed of the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, I have a couple of answers to some questions that were raised last night. I'm still waiting on some, uh, but I'll provide the ones that I've got so far. Um, with regards to the number of premises that would be covered by this legislation, I previously advised the House that the number would vary each year and that if the legislation was enforced in 2020, the legislation would have applied to 50 premises, which included 15 hospitals, 34 general practices and one other. I was asked to clarify two points. So the two main um, clinics in WA are included in the number of hospitals and other refers to a telehealth service, which is not operational anymore but was at the time. Um, yesterday we had some discussion about issuing move-on notices outside abortion clinics. Um, I would like to advise the House that we have been advised by WA Police that one move-on notice was given in 2014 outside one of the main uh, clinics. Now, I had already explained to the House some of the reasons why move-on powers under the Criminal Investigation Act 2008 only provides the police with very limited ability, ability to deal with the types of behaviours outside uh, abortion health services. Uh, but this figure again demonstrates that we urgently need to provide WA Police with appropriate enforcement tools to deal with these unique situations targeting women and staff accessing those clinics. Uh, I would also like to table the uh, WA Women's Health and Wellbeing Policy, uh, Priority Area B, uh, Health and Wellbeing Impacts of Gender-Based Violence, uh, which refers to threats of harm or coercion, as was requested by the Honourable Nick Moran last evening. So the document, and then, is um, the document is tabled. Thank you. And uh, I previously provided a list of government agencies that were consulted during the work on the bill. Uh, we can advise that in addition, in addition to that list, uh, the following agencies were also consulted, the Department of Communities and the Mental Health Commission. And the Department of Communities uh, was, was consulted via the Minister for Volunteering, the Minister for Women's Interests. Minister for Citizenship, Multicultural Affairs and the Minister for Disability Services. Honourable James Haven. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. I, I only have a, a couple of questions. I don't expect to keep you uh, all that long. Thank you for your uh, patience. Um, but I just 
last night, just before we did run out of time, I've got the question out. So we were talking a bit about um, the behaviour outside of these premises. And I was just making the point and just wanted confirmation from you that, in fact, the bill is designed to capture uh, uh, the very presence of individuals out the front of these places, not just um, besetting, harassing, intimidating, interfering, threatening, hindering, uh, obstructing or impeding a person. Uh, it is the case that, say, a single uh, lady standing out the front of this premises or within 150 metres holding a brochure um, would fall foul of this legislation and would be would be breaking the, the law. That, 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 that's, that's, am I correct in my understanding of, of that? Minister. Uh, so that person, if they were reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety, uh, they would be captured by the legislation. Honourable James Hayward. Uh, so you're saying it is possible for somebody to stand out the front and be seen uh, without contravening this law, because that's, that's certainly not my understanding. Uh, but I'd just ask for clarification again on that point. Minister. The communication uh, would need to be in relation to abortion. So, if somebody standing outside, handing out, you know, um, containers for change, pamphlets, recycle your materials, or whatever, they wouldn't be captured by, by the legislation before us. But if into to abortion and was likely to cause anxiety, then they may well be captured. Honourable James Hayward. Thank you very much. Yeah, I apologise. I didn't make that clearer. Yeah. So, in relation to, uh, they have a, a pro-life person say with a pamphlet about abortion. So, but I'm interested to hear. You, are you saying that it could be lawful for them to stand out the front on the condition that they weren't causing um, distress or anxiety? Minister. So if, as you've pointed out, if it does, a person engages in prohibited behaviour if the person besets, harasses, intimidates, etc., etc., uh, uh, subject to subsection 3, communicates by any means in relation to abortion in a manner that is able to be seen or heard by a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided and reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety, then that would be captured. But I remember that that is um, that is really getting into the detail now, and so that is at clause four. So I think it's probably more appropriate to, if, if you've got a, you a line of questioning on that, I think we'll park it till we get to clause four. And with James Hayward. Well, the other um, issue I had was just to be talked about um, without reasonable excuse. So reasonable excuse doesn't uh, doesn't sound like a very high legal benchmark. Um, and I noticed in the explanatory notes there were some examples potentially where um, reasonable excuses could be. So it's a prohibited behaviour to photograph people potentially, but if you uh, operate the service station over the road and have security cameras which will automatically capture people coming and going, that would be a reasonable excuse as I understand. Um, so I'm interested in, in just, you know, I guess, hearing what the Minister has to say in that regard. Um, and it also had some, there was an example of a, say, a television uh, cameraman, uh, somebody working in the media, um, where it also talked about it would only be, it wouldn't be an offence for them that that would be a, uh, as the wording says, a reasonable excuse. Minister. Thank you. 
So, um, so yes, the, prevent, the, the offence provision includes a reasonable excuse exemption, which could cover various scenarios. For example, where a journalist is reporting on a matter of public interest for publication in a legitimate news medium, uh, a clinic or a nearby property undertaking a recording of its premises for security purposes, or police undertaking a recording for the purposes of enforcing the provisions of the bill. Um, recording is also permitted with the consent of a person shown accessing or leaving premises providing abortions. James thank, thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, later it talks a bit about the uh, transmission of those recordings. So that's uh, clearly a different uh, situation. Um, so a broadcaster potentially can broadcast images filmed there on the condition that they don't lead to identifying. So they're fuzzied up is the term I think that's used. Um, I'd just be interested to know if that is your understanding of how that would work. Minister. Thank you. And certainly, Honourable Member, I don't have the, the luxury of your years in the television industry, so I'm not sure what the technical term is for uh, pixelating the screen. But certainly, the publication of a recording can be permitted in certain circumstances. The offence provision includes a few tests, including a reasonable excuse exemption. So a publication of a recording of someone accessing or leaving premises at which abortions are provided may be permitted if, for example, consent has been given, the person's face is obscured, or there is no link between the woman and the abortion clinic. Honourable James Hayward. Thank you very much. And just one final question. Um, it dawned on me in relation to the detail of, the, um, of what uh, distribute, distribute was. Uh, sorry. What community, uh, sorry, yeah, what distribute includes in terms of the terms used. I'm wondering if a newspaper reporter, a journalist reports that a football star turned up at a location in the paper with his girlfriend, while his wife was at work, um, potentially, which um, might be uh, trashy news, but is in the reality of uh, things that can happen. Is that an offence, given that they have publicised the um, attendance within that safe zone? Minister. Thank you. So, 202Q states a person must not, without consent of another person or without reasonable excuse, publish or distribute a recording of the other person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided if the recording contains particulars that are likely to lead to the identification of A, the other person, and B, the other person as a person accessing premises at which abortions are provided. So, that would be captured. It would be. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Graham. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, Minister, you have um, kindly tabled today a copy of the Western Australian Women's Health and Wellbeing Policy entitled Lifting the Health Profile of Women and Girls. And yesterday you were uh, quoting from one section of that. Can you just draw to my attention that portion that you were quoting from yesterday? Thank you, Deputy Chair. So, Honourable Member, I was quoting from page 22, page 22.
page titled Priority Area B, Health and Wellbeing Impacts of Gender-Based Violence. And then uh, in that paragraph, I think I quoted the sentence that says it includes any acts of violence that causes or could cause physical, sexual or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of harm or coercion in public or in, public, or in private life. But I've just been given the, the pink and I'll just check that. That's exactly what I said. Honourable Nick Graham. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Minister, the reason I ask is because um, we were uh, dealing with that on the fly last night, and um, I certainly thought that I um, heard you make some um, effectively encouraging uh, commitments on behalf of the uh, government, indicating that there would be some progress made in regards to some of the matters that arose from the discussion paper. I gave the example uh, yesterday uh, at, at your request of a segment in the discussion paper where there was reference to approximately 500 of the submissions that had been received indicated and discussed how women are forced, manipulated and coerced into the decision to have an abortion and how approximately 250 submissions suggested better holistic counselling and support for patients to be made available. Now, in response to that, uh, you uh, quoted from this uh, document and which has now been provided. Now, that page, page 22, I notice, talks about why these things are a priority, and indeed they are, a, a, they, well, they should be a priority. This is a 2019 uh, document. Um, but are you able to take us any further in regards to whether there is something specifically being done by the government to address the issue of uh, counselling and support? I notice, for example, at page... Um, uh, page 25 under priority area C entitled maternal reproductive and sexual health and wellbeing that it does seem to touch on some of these things um, but it's not clear to me that there is an action arising that makes sure that there is definitely counselling and support that is provided to um, anyone with an unexpected uh, pregnancy. Can you just clarify whether that is addressed in this particular document or if there is some other kind of commitment? Minister. Thank you. So, uh, remember, yes, so, so last night I think I'd, I'd um, uh, advise that the Department of Health is updating its guidelines, abortion care for medical practitioners, information and legal obligations to include advice that medical practitioners performing abortions should consider an appropriate environment for uh, assessing the pregnant woman to ensure as far as possible that no coercion or pressure is, is being applied. Um, I am aware we do fund five unplanned pregnancy counselling services uh, through the Department of Health. Well, separately, though, what I was alluding to was that, that the issues that you raised last night are under consideration by government and have been noted in at least this document. And so it, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue by government. So there was no, 
no kind of commitment per se given to you other than uh, you know, some work is being done by government. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Um, thanks, Minister. I guess that this, this is, uh, really goes to the heart of the concern of um, those uh, individuals. I think there were more than 2,000 people that signed the petition that I tabled yesterday in respect <coughs> uh, to this matter. And um, to paraphrase really the concern of uh, those uh, petitioners, it is to ensure that if there is a Western Australian with an um, unexpected uh, pregnancy, or uh, as some would say, unplanned, um, unplanned or un unexpected, uh, that there is appropriate support for that person, irrespective of the choice that they might make, including taking into account the possibility that people might change their mind with respect to those choices. Now, I notice in the document that's been provided at page 27, under the heading Enhance and Support Equitable Access to Reproductive Health Services, there is a line item there entitled C7, and the action says continually work towards providing and promoting equitable access to affordable reproductive health services responsive to the woman's individual needs and preferences. There should be these should be delivered in a non-judgmental and safe environment without fear of harassment or intimidation while maintaining patient safety and privacy. I totally agree. Um, there's no good reason why um, uh, this should not be provided in a non-judgmental and a safe environment and there's no good reason why it shouldn't be provided without fear or harassment or intimidation and uh, a, a patient's safety and privacy should have uh, received the utmost respect. Now, in that context, um, Minister, are you able to advise us if there is any clause in this bill which provides an immunity, an immunity to employees of uh, abortion clinics? Thank you. So, so the, the reason, I'm member, I'm not quite sure, though, what the point is you're making or trying to make. So, perhaps you might tease it out for us. Um, well, to be more precise, um, is is uh, an employee of an abortion clinic uh, able to be uh, charged with an offence under this legislation if they were to? Uh, if they were to engage in prohibited behaviour, uh, would they themselves uh, be subject to these offences or would there be some form of immunity for them? Minister. So, so if, those, if those staff members were harassing a member of the public, uh, there is no immunity uh, for them. But if you look at 202P, a member, well, no, there's no. nothing in here about harassing a member of the public. No, no, but I thought that's what sorry. you just said. Yeah. No, no. Um, but if, sorry, if, if the staff member was harassing one of the clients, for example, yes. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be protected by the bill before us. So they, they, could, they, they could be charged. They could be captured by two. Well, look, uh, Minister, I think that that is uh, very comforting to hear, very comforting to hear at all, uh, indeed, because um, as the government's uh, West Australian women's health and wellbeing policy indicates, there is a commitment uh, to providing services that are non-judgmental 
in a safe environment without fear of harassment or intimidation and maintaining the patient's safety and privacy. Now, the context in which I raise this, Minister, is because I have been informed of multiple Western Australian cases, multiple Western Australian cases, where uh, individuals have attended upon um, at least one of the uh, clinics in question, and after, after they went in and wanted to change their mind, they were harassed they were harassed by the workers in, in, in the clinic. Now, I, at the time, and I, I heard of this several years ago, um, I had mixed feelings about it. In one sense, I wasn't surprised, but in another, in another sense, I was absolutely shocked that this kind of behaviour would be happening. Now, as equally as I condemn the practice of any person, and I've said this on more than one occasion yesterday, as much as I condemn the behaviour of any Western Australian who is trying to hinder another Western Australian from going about their lawful business, even more so I condemn the behaviour of those people working in those clinics who would behave in that fashion. And I'm pleased to hear that it's on the record that those people will be subjected to the offences in this legislation when this bill inevitably passes. Now, um, Minister, I take it then that the only oversight that would be able to be provided in that context, if it was actually an employee of the abortion clinic who was doing the harassing, uh, that the only oversight mechanism in place would be Western Australian Police. Uh, I guess at the heart of that question is just to clarify who is going to be um, entrusted with the role of um, investigating and prosecuting these offences. Minister. Thank you. So if I can answer this way, so any offence under this bill would be investigated by, by West Australian Police. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. And I take it then that that's the only um, uh, that's the only oversight uh, body then with regard to these these clinics is West Australian Police uh, and and whether or not they are operating in accordance with this Act or any other legislation. Minister. Thank you, Honourable Member. So, uh, as I made clear, in terms of this bill itself, um, the police will do the investigation. In terms of 
a staff member who you know who is in one of the one of these centres, and um, presumably they're a clinician of sort, be it a nurse or a doctor, if they were to um, to transgress, say, APRA's guidelines, for example, well, it, what my understanding is it would be open to APRA to investigate. But again, that's their process and their guidelines, and so I, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm not au fait with them. No, that's fine, Minister. So, in, in essence, what we're saying is that if there is a Western Australian who is who feels um, harassed as they want to leave, they want to exit the abortion clinic because they've changed their mind. They don't want to proceed anymore. They want to continue with their with the pregnancy. They feel harassed by the um, uh, worker, the employee. Uh, they have two courses of action available to them. One is a complaint to APRA and the other one is a, a complaint to WA Police. Minister. Sorry, there's been a bit of <laughs> interaction. So, so a staff member could be captured by the issue. So if a staff member did, 
undertook the issue that you raised that could be captured by this bill. This, that is, that's, the, the example you gave is not the purpose of the bill. So the purpose of the bill is to provide safe access zones around premises at which abortions are provided so as to protect the safety and wellbeing and respect the dignity and privacy of persons accessing the service provided at those premises and employees and other persons who need to access those premises in the course uh, of their duties and responsibilities and then it prohibits um, publication. My advisors tell me that, the, that there are other mechanisms like APRA and potentially a complaint to HADSCO, for example, where a complaint like you have raised uh, would be better uh, investigated. However, it has been, has been said that in, you know, it could be the case that staff members will be captured by this, depending on the severity of the, um, the interaction. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. That does provide uh, a good level of comfort. Now, um, uh, just as we close out the discussion on, on Clause 1, um, yesterday we discussed a little bit um, about the Public Order in Streets Act and the permit system, and um, you were going to check with WA Police if there had been circumstances where they had uh, failed to respond to an application. We, we had information before us that uh, all application, no application had ever been refused, and so that's not in dispute. But um, whether there have been any applications where there just simply hasn't been a response from government, um, I'll just take it by interjection if you want, Minister. The other answer, and when I, when I commented earlier on, I said these are, the, these are the answers I have thus far. You did say there were some other things, yes. There, there's, yep. there's another one in relation to which police station okay. investigates, or, so, so that there are outstanding issues. Works in progress, yep, no problem. Now, um, with regard to this um, uh, intriguing uh, number of locations, we had the discussion about whether it was 50 or 51 and another number had been provided by another member at some other stage. Now, um, very interestingly, the information that's been provided this afternoon is that the two clinics are considered to be um, part of the, 15, the cohort that are the 15 hospitals. Um, now, I don't uh, take uh, objection with that, I just simply note it as intriguing. But in terms of the category that was listed yesterday as one other, uh, you mentioned that it's a telehealth service. Now, I'd, I acknowledge that you mentioned, as far as I can recall, that that uh, telehealth service is no longer operating. Um, but the reason it's piqued my interest is because you'll recall yesterday that the Honourable Martin Aldridge was expressing concerns, if, as I understand his concern, that Western Australians might not know exactly where these 150 metre zones exist because uh, the information is not necessarily readily available or well known. Obviously, with respect to the two clinics, it is. Now, if one of them was going to be a telehealth service, how would the 150 metre zone um, work in that, in that instance? Minister. Thanks. So, if I can clarify, so that, that, that other was, was, was a telehealth service, but it was also at a physical service. A telehealth service wouldn't be captured by the bill before us, would not, because it needs to be a physical place where the service is provided, and then that 150 metre rule applies. So, to be clear, Minister, there'd been, I mean, a telehealth service. Um, it has to be accessing, so there's the physical, right. you know, have to yes. be going to it. Now look, that makes sense because I mean the telehealth service will still be located physically somewhere, uh, but the the information that we're being provided 
um, which I think is encouraging, is that there is no zone around that physical location, um, except in, a, in an instance where the telehealth service was also being provided, where there is actually a, a physical service being provided. So that makes sense. So thank you for, for clarifying uh, that. And um, Minister, just checking my notes, I've just got one final question then in respect to clause one, and that is, uh, the issue of the reversal of the onus of proof. Does any clause in this bill reverse the onus of proof? Minister. Thank you. I'm told nothing here reverses the onus of proof, Honourable Member. Members, the question is that clause one stand as printed. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those of the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is that clause two stand as printed. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those of the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is that clause three stand as printed. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those of the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is that Clause 4 stand as printed. Honourable Nick Graham. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, Minister, a number of questions arise from uh, Clause 4, which is the most substantive clause uh, in this five-clause bill. Um, can I commence, uh, Minister, just in respect to uh, the issue of uh, the legal advice uh, that had been provided with regard to the 150 metre uh, boundary. Now, at page 3, line 27 of the bill, there is reference there. Well, I think it's the only reference to the 150 metre boundary, and it is in the definition of a safe uh, access zone. You did in indicate earlier that um, a couple of things, as I recall. One is that there's a commitment on the part of the government to model this legislation on the Victorian provision. I take it that that um, uh, is in part intended to mean the 150 metre zone in the Victorian legislation, but also you did um, go to some lengths to explain about the High Court decision in the club case. Um, has the government received any advice on whether uh, a, a zone could be uh, larger than 150 metres? So, so a, a different zone, honourable member, was considered as part of the consultation process. Uh, however, in light of the club case and the High Court's decision, and the fact that it found that the, my words, not the judge's words, that the 150 metre zone was appropriate in Victoria, I can't think of the word, can't remember the yes. words it said. Um, it was decided that 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 zone, that distance, was appropriate for Western Australia, and and then separately. I think I alluded to it yesterday, probably, I probably quoted the fact that 70 odd percent of those who supported safe access zones supported the distance too. So it kind of. Yes, and so, but the question remains then, Minister, is, has the government received any legal advice uh, about a zone being more than 150 metres? Now, it might be the case that the government said, no, we're not going to get any legal advice on that because we've decided to go with the Victorian legislation because of the club decision. That would be quite um, plausible, but equally it may be the case that the government did seek legal advice on the possibility of a zone being more than 150, and it's that latter matter that I'm interested in. Minister. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not aware of any honourable member, any legal advice in that regard. Nick Graham. Now, Minister, how will the, um, the existence of these uh, zones uh, be communicated to the public?
Minister. Thank you. So I'm told that the Department of Health will inform uh, all health services in WA that provide abortion services, uh, as well as any relevant stakeholders, about the changes. The Department is also preparing a media release and a website with information that summarises the new prohibitions, as well as a list of frequently asked questions for the public, and that includes groups affected by this legislation. And um, you, re you referred to, in a generic sense, uh, stakeholders. Is, is there something more specific in terms of who's going to have this communicated to them? Minister. Thank you. So I'm happy to provide a commitment, honourable member, that the Department of Health will will write to um, those organisations who are listed in the report, who've made a submission to the process, and advise them of the change in legislation and you know link to the website and stuff. So to make sure that those, for example, pro-life groups um, would be aware of of, of the changes. Now, this then plays into the commencement uh, issue because in the clause that we've passed at clause two, which I'm not seeking to tra re traverse, um, simply states that the uh, bill will commence the day after assent. Now, if this information is going to be communicated, um, and, and I thank the government for the commitment to provide, I think, as a matter of fairness to those organisations information about this. Um, when will that be provided? I mean, will that be provided before um, commencement? Um, are we running a risk potentially here that the information will be provided to people after the event? Minister. Thank you. So uh, we can commit to, to a letter going out at the same time as a uh, as as the media release. So so upon the the assent, at the same time a media release will, will be issued um, saying that the bill has been assented to, and at the same time a letter will go out and the website will be made available and the link in that letter will be will link to the website with a detail about the legislation. I'm further advised that in the in the first you know, days, kind of week or so, however long after the after the uh, the bill is assented to, um, my advisors tell me that the police would um, would you know would be would be have a cautious approach and would likely you know work with people and advise people that and make sure that they're aware of the fact that um, that the law has changed. So it's not heavy-handed immediately. Uh, however, um, it, it's up to police to, yep. to process. But that's certainly the intention. Look, uh, thank you, um, Minister. Again, I find that uh, encouraging and, and comforting, and I think it's fair. Um, I, I think that, um, as a matter of fairness, <clears throat> if, when this uh, law passes, we have uh, people behaving in a fashion that we would all agree uh, was utterly uh, unreasonable, uh, for example, uh, one of the examples that have been pr provided previously is, is heckling. If there was anything like that, then I've got no problem with police taking a more heavy-handed approach. But where there are examples of individuals who genuinely are ignorant of the passage of this bill, 
um, and who are not continuing to present day in, day, day out, um, and they are there in a peaceful fashion, then I'm encouraged to hear that that would be the type of scenario where you would expect WA Police to exercise some discretion and to utilise the opportunity to inform people of the new laws, ask them politely to move on, and um, I think that would be sufficient. That would seem to me to be consistent with the type of approach on an entirely different matter, say, for example, where people haven't been complying with the contact registers and things like that, where the police have taken a very sensible approach and taken more of an uh, educative role uh, rather than um, a, a more sort of a penal type of uh, approach towards these things. So I am encouraged by that and I thank you for that information, uh, Minister. Now, in terms of the, uh, the, the premises and, and this website and so forth, um, again, this goes to the issue of the actual location of the, pre of the premises. Uh, if I take you in clause four, specifically to uh, section 202N, and at page two, line 19, where it refers to premises at which abortions are provided. And that is actually a defined term. If you turn then to section 202O, page three, line 14, you'll see there that what that says is it does not include a registered pharmacy as defined in the Pharmacy Act 2010, section 3.1. So the definition only tells you what it doesn't include, but it doesn't then go so far as to explain to you what is included. So we have to then rely on the ordinary meaning of the words premises at which abortions are provided. Now we know from the dialogue that we've previously had um, that there are up to around 50, approximately 50 of these uh, type of sites. I understand that they consist of private hospitals, public hospitals and indeed general practitioners that are registered providers of the AU486 drug. Uh, Given, given that private hospitals and public hospitals, if I can just deal with that category first, that type of information is, is readily available. Uh, is there any objection on the part of the, of the government when they do this um, uh, website and frequently ask questions and so forth to actually list those 15 hospitals? Minister. Thank you. A d decision hasn't been made on that, honourable member. Um, that will be considered as part of the implementation of the legislation. So you've, I think you've, if I can infer that, I think your suggestion is that perhaps a list of those 15 should be on the website. I'm happy to note that, and I'll enhance that now, and I'm happy to ensure that the department considers that as part of the implementation process. Okay, and um, so this, uh, I mean, the same point is then uh, uh, made with regard to the uh, 35 uh, GPs that are registered AU486 providers. And I guess the, the, the point I would simply make, so this is more of a comment than a question at this stage, um, it would be interesting for the government to obtain um, any advice, legal advice on enforcement in circumstances where they have not provided a list. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, member, noting that that was a comment and noting the time, I will leave. Is the time? Oh. <laughs> it's time. It's time. <laughs> noting the time, I will leave the chair until the ringing of the bells. Honourable members, the president. Members, are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice of which some has been given is the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. Uh, I refer to the registration and compliance of wastewater treatment systems. I sound very loud today. 
um, in Western Australia and charge changes in this industry for secondary treatment standards for wastewater. But I ask one, are Western Australian businesses wanting to install secondary wastewater treatment systems expected to be certified as compliant or certified to AS 1546.7.2 2017? Two, if yes to one, can they access testing for that compliance in Western Australia? Three, if noted to, are border closures Im impacting on their ability to access testing elsewhere? And four, if so, will the government now assist with the process to ensure WA businesses are not closed due to the impact of no testing facilities in WA and the border closures from COVID-19? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following answers provided, uh, I'm not sure on, which, on behalf, behalf of which minister it doesn't say, but anyway, I'm providing it. Um, one, uh, Western Australian businesses are required to comply with the stated Australian standards when installing secondary wastewater treatment systems. AS 1546.7 2017 does not exist. Two to three, not applicable. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Energy. Uh, I refer to the financial years 2016, uh, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, and 2021, and I ask one, for each financial year, how many residential rooftop solar systems have been installed in Western Australia? And two, for each financial year, what is the total amount of energy purchased through the Renewable Energy Buyback Scheme? It's uh, 499. Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the uh, member for the question, and the uh, following information has been provided to me by the Minister uh, for Energy. Uh, now, this is substantially in tabular form, out, um, uh, outlining the number of uh, rooftop solar installations and outlining the total amount of energy. Um, uh, purchased through those, that scheme, uh, and uh, it's in tabular form, so I'm going to seek leave. to have that incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave's granted. Yep. Uh, the Honourable Colin de Grasse. Uh, thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to the Quarantine Advisory Panel, QAP, the 10-member advisory panel appointed on 27 May 2021 to oversee hotel quarantine in WA and the advice received from the Minister for Health in response to questions 377 and 378 asked by the Honourable Mia Davies MLA yesterday in the other place. And I ask one, how many times has the QAP met, detailing for each meeting, a, the dates they met at least once, b, whether quorum was achieved or not, c, the number of conflicts of interest recorded, and d, whether external advisers or observers attended and who those individuals were, two, how many times has the QAP provided concurrent advice to the Minister for Health, or the Chief Executive Officer and the form in which that advice was provided. Three, are communiques and minutes of the QAP meetings publicly available? If, if yes, where can these be located? If these documents are not publicly available, will the Premier please table these documents? Leader of the House. For some notice of the question. Uh, one, a 14th of June 2021 and the 27th of July 2021. B, yes, both meetings. C, nil both meetings. D, nil both meetings. Two, as stated in section 4.5 of the Quarantine Advisory Panel Terms of Reference, Legislative Assembly tabled paper number 256. The QAP may, in limited circumstances and if considered necessary and appropriate, provide concurrent advice to the Chief Executive Officer of the Department of Health and the Minister for Health. Three, I table the attached minutes of the QAP meeting on 14 June 21, which have been finalised. Uh, the Honourable Yorn Sibma. Some notices given is to the Minister for Mental Health, uh, representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to the Minister's media statement confirming that the government has entered into a $23 million contract to build the Environment Online Approvals Portal, and I ask one, noting that the government has promised the development of Environment Online for years and funded the program in the 2020-21 budget, why has it taken the government this long to appoint a contractor? Two, noting that the last budget funded the Environment Online project to a level of $28 million, what has happened to the residual $5 million? Uh, three, is it correct to interpret the Minister's statement as confirming that the project will not be fully functional until the 2023-24 financial year, as opposed to the 2022-23 target date referred to in last year's budget? And four, what level of functionality is anticipated per each development phase of the Environment Online project until the project is completed? Uh, those documents tabled, uh, 
provided by the Leader of the House, our table, to the Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, Environment Online is a significant investment that required detailed planning and evaluation of potential contractors via the procurement process overseen by the Department of Finance. A request for tender was issued in October 2020, and the evaluations of proposals involved testing the performance of the preferred respondent via a capability pilot project. The contract was awarded on successful completion of that pilot. Two, $23 million represents the value of the contract for the system integrator or build partner for Environment Online. A separate contract valued at $4.5 million was awarded on 31 March 2021 for program management services. Three to four, Environment Online is designed to be delivered in seven distinct phases over the next three years, with additional functionality available at the conclusion of each phase. Each phase will, will deliver full functionality for the relevant regulatory activities as outlined below. Phase one, environmental impact assessment. Phase two, industry regulation. Phase three, native vegetation regulation and offsets. Phase four, incidents and, and investigations. Phase five, waste regulation. Phase six, contaminated sites regulation. And phase seven, water regulation. The Honourable Nick Guerin. About notice of which some notice has been given us to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Minister for Health. I refer to your answer to my question on notice number 151 and to the MNS reference group and I ask one, what reason did the group give the Chief Health Officer for the recommended changes to the Form 2? Two, on what date and in what form was that recommendation made? Three, is the group's recommendation and reasons contained in any written document? And four, if yes to three, will you table those documents? Minister for Mental Health. <coughs> Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. I have been advised by the Department of Health that further time is required to answer this question. The information will, will be provided to the honourable member by the 17th of August 2021. The honourable Donna Farragher. Mr. President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the redeployment of school health nurses to COVID-19 vaccination clinics, and I ask one, how many schools have had their access to school health nurses reduced as a result of this redeployment? Two, have school health nurses been redeployed on a voluntary basis, and if not, what was the selection process? And three, have any child health nurses been redeployed to COVID-19 vaccination clinics, and if so, how many? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to three. The Department of Health has, rec has requested the Department of Education to assist with the COVID-19 vaccination program. The COVID-19 vaccination program is an important priority for the health and safety of all Western Australians. Therefore, all efforts need to be made to ensure the vaccination program continues to build momentum so we get as many Western Australians vaccinated as quickly as possible. I can advise that some school nurses will assist the COVID-19 vaccination blitz, and the Department of Education has advised there will be minimal impact and these changes present no risk to student safety. The Honourable Peter Collier. When you're ready. I am now. Thank you, President. My question without notice, which some is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the establishment of the Bikey Task Force Operation Seagrass in September 2018. I ask one, how many personnel were employed when Operation Seagrass was established? And two, how many personnel were employed in Operation Seagrass on July 1, 2019, 2020, and 2021? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of this question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One to two, the Western Australian Police, I should say Police Force, advise as this operation concluded in early 2020, the number of personnel attached to the operation can be provided, and was 35 personnel with resources from other police units used on an as needs basis. The Honourable Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Commerce, C455. I refer to the review of the Residential Tenancies Act 1987 that commenced in 2019, of which the consultation period ended June 30, 2020. And I ask, will the Minister please provide an update on the progress of the review, uh, specifically when is the review expected to be completed? When will the results from the review be released and when can we expect to see the subsequent legislation introduced? Thank you. Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question and the uh, Minister for Commerce has provided the following information. A, the review is current. The consultation phase has concluded and outcomes are expected to be provided to government before the end of 2021. The government expects to be able to inform stakeholders about its response to the review before the end of 2021. 
subsequent legislation will be subject to government's legislative priorities. The Honourable Wilson Tucker. President, my question with that notice, in which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer the Premier to the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, dated 9th of August 2021, which found that average temperatures in Australia increased by approximately 1.4 degrees since 1910, and which warns that we are on track for rising sea levels, increased and more intense bushfires, increased droughts and increased floods. I also refer the Premier to his comments in October 2019, in which he said during in, in, an interview on 6PR, and I quote, a climate emergency, I don't know what that means. In light of the IPCC's findings, will the Premier finally admit that the state is facing a climate emergency? Uh, the Leader of the House. <clears throat> the question. I refer the Honourable Member to the Western Australian Climate Policy, published in 2020, which underscores the state government's commitment to adapting to climate change and to working with all sectors of the economy to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The Honourable Sophia Melmond. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer the Minister to the, uh, ch the Child Inside in Australia. We prosecute 10-year-olds, prosecute especially if they're black. Published on New Matilda on June 28, 2020, by Warwick Jones, and I ask one. Does the Minister support legislation in favour of increasing the minimum age of criminal responsibility? And two, does the State Government have any plans to increase this beyond 14 years of age? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney General. One, the Attorney General is proud to have placed the question of raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility on the agenda of the former Council of Attorney Generals, CAG. The honourable member may be aware that due to the Attorney General's advocacy, Western Australia chaired a cross-jurisdictional working group examining this issue on behalf of CAG. Any changes would require resources and, consider and careful consideration to ensure that the small number of children who exhibit serious offending at a young age can be properly managed outside the criminal justice system. The WA government already diverts young people away from the criminal justice system where reasonable to no. The Honourable Brian Walker. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice of which some notice has been given, number C485, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the Kalgoorlie Minor of 9th of August 2021, and in particular to an article entitled Survey Finds Reluctance from GPs on Cannabis. What the national poll actually found was doctors citing cost and the lack of knowledge on their own part as the main reasons for not prescribing medicinal cannabis. Acknowledging that cost is intrinsically linked to the PBS and our federal colleagues, I ask. One, what, if anything, is the McGowan government in general and the health department in particular doing to educate GPs on the availability and application of medical cannabis? And two, will the minister push for more formalized training on medicinal cannabis to be made available to doctors both during their university training and beyond. Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. One, comprehensive information on access to medicinal cannabis products is published by the National Medicines Regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. This includes detailed evidence-based clinical guidelines, information and resources for prescribing doctors. The Western Australian Department of Health, DOH, uh, assisted in the development of these guidelines. The National Prescribing Service also has a range of resources for patients and health practitioners. The DOH endorses and provides links to these resources in online materials related to medicinal cannabis. Two, no, the inclusion and coverage of specific aspects of therapeutic management of diseases in accredited university training qualifications for registered health practitioners are a matter for the respective individual education institutions to consider. The Honourable James Haywood. Thank you, President. My question, uh, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Housing First Homelessness Initiative, and I ask one, please provide a breakdown of the $270,000 uh, spent up to 4th of August 2021, specifically how much is spent on administration, staffing and direct assistance for homeless people. Two, how many people has Housing First Initiative helped to find accommodation, resulting in those people no longer being uh, homeless? Three, 
Considering the lack of available social housing in the short to medium term, will the Minister consider an interim options for homeless people in Bunbury to provide a safe and protected space for rough sleeping? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Disability Services. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided by the Minister for Community Services. One, the communities provides funding to organisations for delivery of services. Funding provided to services providers is not broken down into administration, staffing and direct assistance. Two, the contracted services continue to work with the identified cohort under the Housing First Homelessness Initiative. I commit to provide to the parliament with an update in results before November 2021. Three, Communities is supportive of funded Housing First support services using temporary and transitional accommodation options with wraparound supports to house clients to help them to get their lives back on track while longer term accommodation is being sourced. Uh, the Honourable uh, Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. My question without notice, for some, which, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the practice of transferring foreign seafarers from ship to shore and on to outbound aircraft in Port Hedland at the National Airport and I ask, how is the minister confident that all seafarers have undertaken their mandatory two weeks uh, isolation aboard their ships prior to the transfer? B, uh, that the same personnel are aboard the vessels throughout the 14-day period. C, that all seafarers are COVID tested and that the results are provided to those managing the transfer prior to transfer and the, that the procedures such as mandatory mask wearing, the separation of all seafarers from the community are being managed in accordance with requirements during the transfer through the community of Port Hedland. And finally, given the concerns of the community of Port Hedland, the prior history of prior breaches, will the minister consider establishing a transparent and publicly available reporting mechanism that outlines details on the movement of seafarers from ship to shore, including their times for transfer destinations within WA and the performance indicators on any breaches in procedures and protocols? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. 1A. WA Health adopts a universal precautions approach, whereby strict precautions are taken for all dealings with and for all movement of seafarers disembarking from international vessels. It is not a WA Health requirement for international seafarers to undertake a two-week quarantine period on board the vessel prior to transfer off the vessel, and this would not guarantee that there is not a COVID-19 outbreak on board the vessel. There are instead legal directions in place that specify restrictions for international crew and mitigation activities for the workers that may be exposed to any international crew. The maritime crew member directions stipulate requirements to mitigate COVID-19 risk of crew members disembarking a vessel. These directions include the requirement that all off signing international seafarers be transported by dedicated conveyances, including a dedicated charter flight from Port Hedland to Perth and enter a state quarantine, quarantine facility unless they are able to board an international flight to their home destination within eight hours. 1B, not applicable. 1C, seafarers are not required to be tested prior to disembarkation if the vessel has been granted pratique and the crew on board are well. Testing prior to disembarkation only occurs at the request of WA Health if Ill illness on board the vessel is suspected. If this occurs, results are made known urgently to WA Health, who manage the movements of the seafarers concerned. 1D. The maritime crew member directions and the transport and accommodation services exposed maritime worker directions stipulate the restrictions placed on seafarers from international vessels, including during their transit through the community. Mask wearing by the international seafarers is mandatory, as are other requirements, including that they occupy a dedicated waiting area at airports. WA Health work closely with key stakeholders, including the Port Authority, shipping agents and WA Police, to ensure the requirements of transfer of seafarers are understood and met. WA Police are responsible for ensuring compliance with the maritime crew member directions and the transport and accommodation services exposed maritime worker directions. Two, the movement of seafarers is controlled by the Emergency Management Act, uh, directions and overseen by WA Police, which provides individual directions to seafarers disembarking a vessel. Any breaches to, pro to protocols are followed up by WA Police and WA Health, and the individuals involved are managed. The Honourable Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, President. Notice which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Police. Uh, I refer to the police air wing and specifically in relation to the three planes 
hope I get the pronunciation right, Pilatus PC12 registration VHWPY, Pilatus PC12 registration VHWPQ and Gippsland Air Van registration VHWPF. I'd ask one, when was each plane last flown? Two, is each plane currently ready for use? Three, if noted two, which planes are not currently ready for use and why not? And four, if noted two, when will those currently unready planes be ready for service? Minister for Mental Health. Uh, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The Western Australian Police Force has access to additional air support, including on a contracted basis, as well as the three planes referred to by the Honourable Member and advisers. One, A, 15 May 2021, B, 11 August 2021, C, 18 June 2021. 2A, two no, 2B, two yes, 2C, two no. 3A, undergoing, uh, undergoing 24 month service and inspection and repaint. Uh, B, not applicable. C, currently used for pilot and crew training only. 4A, scheduled for week commencing 30 August 2021. B, not applicable. C, scheduled for week commencing 16 August 2021. The Honourable Colin de Grasse. Thank you, President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Agriculture. I refer to your government's announcement to fast track the recruitment of nurses from overseas and interstate, including increasing the entry cap for people entering the state to quarantine and paying for these expenses. And I ask, will the government offer similar support packages for other sectors desperately in need of workers, including the agricultural sector, which is predicting the state's largest ever grain harvest? The, the, the Honourable the Minister for Regional Development. Thank you. I uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, and uh, as the member is uh, probably well aware uh, that we are actively running the seasonal worker uh, program in this state and that we currently have uh, 1,400 uh, seasonal workers that we, um, through our state government uh, unit, uh, have, uh, have supported coming into, uh, into the state. And we have uh, two planes a month uh, that are booked um, between now and the end of the year, subject to there being uh, the demand by growers. So uh, by the end of, uh, of this year, we would be looking at having uh, something in the order of 2,000 uh, seasonal workers who stay outside of our cap so that they are not included in that cap. So that has been a program that we have actively um, supported um, and, uh, and driven in this, uh, in this state. Now, um, uh, we are, many of those workers, of course, are not experienced in grain harvest. There's not a lot of broad acre in Vanuatu or Tonga. Um, but we do note that a lot of the backpackers that are traditionally used aren't also uh, necessarily experienced. Now, in addition to that work, and we are trying to bring, um, uh, we are working very closely with people like Mick Fells from uh, the Grains Division of WAF uh, to uh, connect up with these workers from Vanuatu. And we had a meeting with a group of farmers today at Mininu about exactly the, the same issue, how we could bring out a group into that area. Um, in addition uh, to that, we have put a proposition uh, to Minister Littleprout. Um, the Federal Minister, we've put a proposition uh, about bringing somewhere between 300 and 900 uh, grain harvest workers in from Northern Europe. We're putting, we have uh, calculated how this would work, what the cost would be, um, and we are asking them to open facilities for fully vaccinated uh, Northern Europeans uh, to come in uh, to help the deliver that um, that grain harvest. I would very, you know, we know that hotel quarantine is absolutely. Um, at its max, uh, and we think that the use of Commonwealth facilities, including those on Christmas Island, would be a, um, a practical outcome. And we've done the costings, and we think uh, that it can be made to work. We've sent that off to Minister Littleproud, and we would encourage the opposition to use its good offices uh, with uh, the federal government to get them on board and helping us meet this situation. The Honourable Nick. Uh, sorry. The Honourable Yorn Sibmar. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, President, my question, uh, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. It's a question from yesterday. Uh, C481 is the reference. 
I refer to your April 14 media statement, uh, quote, important staffing boost for WA hospitals, end quote, which outlined plans to launch an advertising campaign and a national and international recruitment drive to fill nursing positions. And I ask one, when will the campaign start and for how long will it run? Two, how much will be spent on the overall campaign and what is the breakdown of spend through the following channels? A, television, B, radio, C, print, D, social media and E, other avenues. Three, which state and countries will the states and countries will the advertising be focused on? Four, has the campaign, if it has started, resulted in any new permanent contracts? And five, if yes to question four above, how many? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answer is uh, answered on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, I have an advice that further time is required to answer this question. The information will be provided to the Honourable Member by tomorrow, the 12th of August 2021. The Honourable Mick Goran. And without notice is to the Minister for Industrial Relations, I refer to your announcement today that public submissions can be made on a draft workers' compensation bill and I ask will the submissions be made public? <laughs> The Minister for Mental Health. Uh, thanks very much, uh, President, and I thank the honourable member for the question. He is indeed correct. I did issue a uh, draft. I, I did issue a press release today uh, relating to a draft bill to modernise workers' compensation laws. This is, of course, uh, me uh, acting uh, and delivering on the 2021 election commitment that was made uh, to pr progress a bill that will modernise workers' compensation laws in Western Australia. Public, public submissions are now open uh, for a three-month period, and they close at the end. Uh, they close the end on November the 10th this year. In relation to the submissions that, that have been uh, that will that will be received as part of that process, uh, no decision has been made on whether they will be released at this stage. Uh, I'm happy. I, I take it by by the honourable member asking the question that he has an interest in those submissions being publicly uh, released. So I'm happy to take that issue on notice and consider it. The honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, notice, in which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the state government's COVID-19 vaccination program, and I ask number one, what is the current stock level of Pfizer first dose vaccinations for each health region? Number two, what is the current stock level of AstraZeneca first dose vaccinations for each health region? And number three, what is the rationale for the distribution of Pfizer stock across the state? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister of Health. One to three, the Commonwealth Government allocates and distributes vaccines to the states and to primary health care providers, sorry, primary care providers, and the planning parameters for the allocation have not been shared with the state. The vaccine stocks provided to WA Health are managed centrally and provided to regional areas as required. As at 10 August 2021, the Pfizer stock on hand for WA Health was 100,794 doses, and the AstraZeneca stock on hand for WA Health was 51,913 doses. Uh, the Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you very much, President. My question, uh, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to driving uh, assessment availability, and I ask how many driving assessment cancellations occurred in Bunbury during the period from the 29th of June to the 21st, uh, to the uh, sorry, from the 29th of June 2021 to the 4th of July 2021, inclusive. What's the current pass fail rate for drivers uh, tested at each of the test locations in the state? Uh, three, how many of the following has the Minister's office received in community members expressing concern about the driving test uh, system uh, failure rate since June 1, 2021? Physical letters, emails and phone calls. Thank you. Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. 141 across the South West. Two, current pass fail rates are in line with the figures provided to the member in response to Legislative Council question without notice 262. Three, this information is not able to be provided in the time frame requested, and as such, the member is asked to place this part of the question on notice. The Honourable Colin de Grasse. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Small Business. I refer to the COVID-19 Small Business Lockdown Assistant Grant and businesses that are currently ineligible to apply for those grants. And I ask one, how many pieces of correspondence has the Minister received relating to small and medium enterprises missing out on COVID-19 support grants? 
Two, is the minister considering broadening the COVID-19 support grants to businesses currently ineligible, such as allied health professionals, boutique clothing stores, tavern owners, wine door seller operations and printing companies? Three, what action is the minister taking to ensure that SMEs such as those in two don't fall through the cracks and end up missing out on COVID support? Four, given the likelihood of an extended hard border with the eastern states, has the minister considered long-term solutions to this issue, such as codes of conduct, policies or regulations? Five, if yes to four, what are these and have they been discussed with the industry bodies or ministers, such as the Minister for Commerce? If yes, please detail. Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, President. And I provide the following response on behalf of the Minister for Small Business. One, the Minister received 45 pieces of correspondence related to small and medium enterprises whose applications did not meet the eligibility for COVID-19 support grants. Two, the McGowan government's $3,000 Small Business Lockdown Assistant Grants Program is a dedicated program designed to deliver a once-off cash flow assistance uh, to small businesses operating in sectors most impacted by the restrictions. The program is in addition to the more than $1.3 billion of COVID-19 assistance the McGowan government has provided to West Australian businesses, which has included electro le electricity bill relief, payroll tax and business licence fee waivers, grants and other industry-specific measures. For the members' benefit, taverns are eligible for the assistance grant. Three, the state government's strong approach to COVID-19 has enabled WA to return to pre-lockdown life quickly without the need for venue and crowd limits, mask wearing or other disruptions to small businesses. As we've experienced in WA, necessary short circuit breaking lockdowns allow, a small business, allow small businesses to return to normal trade as quickly as possible. Four to five, it is unclear what the member is referring to with these questions. The member is respectfully requested to rephrase them. The Leader of the House. Jim? The business of the House is resumed. Are there any further President. answers? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Peter Collier's question without notice 446, asked yesterday, which I seek leave to have incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave's granted. Thank you. And President, pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I wish to inform the House that the question that the answer to question on notice number 153, asked by the Honourable Brad Pettit, MLC to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment, will be provided tomorrow, the 12th of August 2021. Any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Uh, members, we return to orders of the day. Uh, order number 24, Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021, and we are in committee. Members, we are dealing with the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021, and the question is that Clause 4 stand as printed. Minister. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Uh, while I'm not even sure if it relates to Clause 4, but anyway, earlier, at an earlier stage of the debate, I undertook to, uh, to get some answers for the Honourable Nick Goran in relation to two issues that affect WA Police. Um, so there was an earlier question, I think it was last, last evening who will be dealing with breaches at WA Police. Any allegations of breaches under the bill would be put through to the State Operation Command and put on the central tasking system. Typically, it will be the local police station who, who will respond to any complaints. Uh, if the local police is otherwise occupied, they will look at the closest available vehicle to respond. So that was one issue you raised last time. The second, um, um, you had suggested that someone had brought to your attention uh, an issue my words, not yours, uh, that WA police were sitting on permit applications or not, not dealing with an appropriate time. 
Um, WA Police have advised us that they are not aware of any specific applications that have not been processed. WA Police would be happy to follow up any specific applications that allegedly has not been processed. Uh, any inquiries about it can be raised directly with WA Police, so I'm happy to provide those issues. Answers. The Honourable Nick Graham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Thank you, uh, Minister. And uh, I'll, I will um, follow up with the source of that information and, uh, if appropriate, uh, follow it up with you uh, behind the chair. Um, now, uh, with regard to the, uh, the list of uh, locations, uh, you indicated that the government uh, is uh, considering uh, whether to uh, provide uh, that list in the website that will be uh, made available uh, at the time uh, or on the day that assent is provided, as I understand the sequence of events. Once this bill uh, is read for the third time, at some stage the government will bring it to the governor. Uh, it will then be, uh, I think it's reasonable to assume, that uh, it will then receive the royal assent and on that day the government will issue a media release, frequently asked questions, there will be a website and the like, and there will also be a letter going out to stakeholders which include uh, the groups that responded to the discussion paper and in and around that there is consideration by government as to whether a list of the uh, locations uh, will be provided. Now, <clears throat> uh, I want to take you, Minister, to the definition of prohibited uh, behaviour. Specifically, it's uh, proposed section 202, subclause PB. Uh, and uh, specifically subclause 2B, I should say. And there you'll see that uh, it mentions that it will be an offence uh, if a person has engaged in prohibited behaviour, and that prohibited behaviour includes communicating by any means in relation to abortion in a manner that is one, able to be seen or heard by a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided, and two, reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. Now, it's that final subclause that uh, I want to get some further explanation on, if I can, Minister. You'll appreciate that um, the, for, for many um, for many people, merely going, merely going to the abortion clinic at first instance is distressing and can cause anxiety. So in that context, how will uh, police be able to distinguish whether it is the communication that has occurred which has reasonably likely to have caused the distress or the anxiety or it is already the existing feelings attributable to the type of procedure that the person is about to encounter at the clinic? Minister. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Uh, on member, so I'm advised that the, the reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety legal test will be applied objectively. It does not require someone to be distressed or anxious. WA Police will need to apply this test. They might, they might also be able to view the behaviour themselves and decide objectively if it is likely to trigger the test in the bill in the particular circumstances. The Honourable Nick Curran. 
So um, you're saying it's an objective test, and uh, is it the case then that the the distress and the anxiety uh, must be uh, caused by the communication? My, advi my advice is to tell me yes. The Honourable Nick Grant. And further to that, Minister, uh, whose responsibility will it be uh, to prove that causal link? Minister. Thanks, Deputy Chair. So obviously uh, the police will enforce those provisions. Now, if they do um, decide to prosecute, well then a court would decide uh, how appropriate and whether indeed this, this part of the Act has been breached. The Honourable Nick Grant. Um, so, Minister, I, I accept that um, in accordance with earlier information you indicated that police would be responsible for both investigating and also prosecuting any offences that arise under this legislation and that, that this legislation uh, could also capture employees of abortion clinics who, who harass or intimidate a person wanting to change their mind and, and, and to leave. And I also accept that it will be a court who at the end of the day will make a decision as to whether an offence has been proven or not. My question is who will be responsible for proving uh, the causal link between the communication and the distress and anxiety? Minister. I advise that would be the police. The Honourable Nick Grant. Now, Minister, in order to be able to uh, prove uh, that the communication caused the distress and anxiety, um, what will be the steps that police will take in order to uh, obtain the evidence to, to satisfy that test? Minister. Thanks. Honourable Member, I can't give you that information. So that, that would be up to police to work out that process. So that, that, you know, their processes are not governed by the Act before us. Um, they will presumably do carry out the same type of investigation as they would with other investigations, but that's, that's within their bailiwick as opposed to what we're telling them that they need to do under this Act. The Honourable Nick Curran. Now, um, Minister, a decision was made by government to uh, house these offences in um, the Public Health Act of 2016. Um, was consideration given to uh, housing the offences in any other place, or was it uh, was this the only place that was considered? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, so I'm advised that the Parliamentary, Parliamentary Council's office who drafted the bill considered the Public Health Act 2016 as the most suitable act to be amended. So the purpose of the new provisions is to ensure that both patients and other people who try to access legal abortion services in WA can do it safety and safely and without intimidation. So the basis for the bill is the need to ensure the protection of those who attend those lawful health services and therefore the whole process was led by the Health Minister and the Department of Health. Hence that act. The Honourable Nick Curran. And this brings up an interesting problem, uh, Minister, because um, Parliamentary Council has advised government that uh, the best place to house these offences is in the Public Health Act. And that has then triggered within government 
uh, a regime which has included that the health minister will take overall carriage for the conduct of the bill, and indeed you're representing him today. And as well as that, the agency that is assisting or has assisted throughout the course of this matter, including briefings and indeed advising you now, is, uh, is health. And yet the problem that then arises is when uh, there isn't uh, adequate um, interaction with other agencies. Here is a classic example where um, having at our disposal for the purposes of this bill <coughs> people who will provide us information as to how the laws will be enforced is actually quite critical for us to understand uh, the purposes of the bill, uh, the provisions of the bill and how they'll be um, actioned. And if we consider for a moment, uh, <coughs> Minister, that uh, the um, thesis that's been provided by government is that the existing regulatory regime is inadequate, it's worth us noting that the existing regulatory regime is actually run by police. So you've got a system at the moment in Western Australia, or at least an assertion. But it's run by police under different laws. That's right. So it's run by, by, by police under different laws, the act that we've referred to earlier. The thesis by government is that that regime is inadequate. Uh, that would normally, if we were in a standing committee uh, hearing give, uh, or a standing committee inquiry, give us the opportunity to call those witnesses in uh, in terms of those who are currently responsible for the regulatory regime. So we would be able to test the thesis that the existing regime is inadequate. We'd be able to find out from them how many people have actually, uh, uh, how many permits have been uh, provided, how many times have there been complaints to police with regard to the permits, what has been the system to enforce those things. We would be able to test those things. Then, when we um, conduct the inquiry further, we would be able to bring in health and understand their rationale for this particular provisions and, and how they intend to address these matters. But we would also then be able to bring in the agency responsible for enforcing these provisions, which in this case would be police, and we would be able to say to them, how do you propose to do these things? You're going to have a responsibility, Commissioner of Police, and your officers to be able to prove the causal link between the communication and that it is reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. It's not going to be a subjective test, it's going to be an objective test. We'd be able to tease out all these things, but we can't because as soon as PCO recommends it's going to be a bill that is best addressed under a health provision, suddenly the system within government doesn't uh, and I don't, I don't say this uncharitably, um, it's not sophisticated at the moment, enough at the moment to be able to then bring in the other agencies to be able to provide this information. So we're at a material disadvantage. Now, I'd make that by way of comment, uh, Minister, not necessarily by way of a question to explain the, the difficulty that we now have in order to be able to better understand these offence provisions and how they're going to be enforced. Uh, that said, can I ask you with respect to the penalties that have been proposed, for example at 202p subsection 1, where the penalty is listed as imprisonment for one year and a fine of $12,000, what was the basis upon which that decision was made for the penalties to be at that level? Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Chair. So the, the proposed penalties reflect the potentially serious nature of offences such as intimidating and harassing and recording people accessing abortion services for the purpose of shaming and humiliating them. The penalties recognise the impact such behaviour can have on women and staff wishing to access premises that perform abortions. 
The penalties are broadly cons consistent with the safe access zone laws introduced around the country. The proposed fine is in the mid-range of penalties applicable to safe access zone offences in other jurisdictions, and the imprisonment penalty is consistent with the majority of other jurisdictions. The proposed penalties are also consistent with the penalties under the Criminal Investigation Act 2006 WA for breaching a move-on order. A maximum 12 months imprisonment penalty will also enable the WA Police to, to obtain identifying particulars from an adult if there is a need for that. It is also important to stress that the penalties attached to the offences prescribed in the Bill are maximum penalties and that, and that the judiciary has discretion about which sentence to impose in each case and it will be able to take into account the objective seriousness of the offence, the offender's circumstances and the impact of the victim the impact of the offence on the victim. The police are not obliged to proceed with those penalties in the first instance that something occurs. They have the ability to caution people or give a move on notice. We are confident that they would be giving guidance about where people could relocate that would place them outside the 150 metre safe access zone. So therefore the decision was made that we, that we took the view that penalties, the penalties are proportionate to the nature of the conduct that we are, that we are wishing to address through this bill. <coughs> The Hon. Nick Graham. Thank you, uh, Minister, for that comprehensive explanation. You mentioned that a majority of the other jurisdictions uh, uh, have uh, an imprisonment uh, penalty. Uh, all of those that do have an, uh, a penalty of imprisonment, are they all at, set at one year? Minister. Uh, so in relation to Queensland, it's uh, 12 months imprisonment, Victoria 12 months imprisonment. Uh, New South Wales is a first offence, which is imprisonment for six months, along with penalty units. So I'm just focusing on the, on the, the, the amount of time. Yep. Um, there is a maximum penalty for a second offence, which is six, which is 12 months. NT uh, maximum is 12 months, and Tasmania uh, 12 months as well. Uh, I haven't got South Australia and the ACT in front of me. And you also mentioned in your response, uh, Minister, about uh, the penalties in Western Australia for a breach of a, of a move on order. Um, what, what is the penalty that is applicable at the moment? Financial penalty as well. Minister. Thanks, President. Uh, Honourable Member, so I, I did um, state that there's a maximum 12 months imprisonment, imprisonment penalty uh, linked to that move on order. I'm not sure if you were asking if there was a financial penalty as well, or you were happy with that? You were asking for financial, okay. So, in relation to, to that, uh, the, the penalty is a fine of $12,000. And imprisonment for 12 months. So that's the Criminal Investigation Act 2006. The Honourable Nick Graham. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. So the point that we can um, make here, Minister, is that in terms of the penalty that's being imposed, it's actually identical to a to a move on uh, order. A breach of that at the moment could attract a, a fine of up to $12,000, and it could attract a term of imprisonment uh, for up to one year. This is no different to that. And so, in that respect, uh, it does seem uh, appropriate. Now, uh, Minister, you might recall that um, uh, earlier uh, during the debates, particularly in respect to Clause 1, we discussed a little bit about whether employees, employees of abortion clinics uh, might be, uh, have any immunity, any immunity under this bill. You indicated that that, that wasn't the case, and I took you through an example where I'm aware of at least a couple of occasions where um, people have entered into a clinic, uh, at first instance intending to uh, uh, procure an abortion, change their mind in the clinic, wanting to leave and then are harassed by the uh, workers there. Um, and that was the reason for my, my concern with respect to that. Now, I was encouraged to hear from you that uh, there will not be an immunity. There will not be an immunity with respect to those workers. If they uh, harass, then uh, they will also be subject to these offences, um, something which has my support. Now, my question, Minister, is when I look at section 202p subsection 3, it does seem to provide some form of immunity 
to those uh, employees. Can you just explain that? Minister. So there is an exemption of sorts. So my advice is that, um, for example, um, so subsection 3 provides that subsection 2b does not apply to an employee or other person who provides services at, at premises at which abortions are provided. So, for example, communication between two staff members of an abortion clinic about their work taking place while they're walking towards the premises uh, would not or should not be considered prohibitive behaviour. The two of them are park their car, they're talking about it, on the way in, that wouldn't be prohibited. The Honourable Nick Graham. So further to the example that I was providing earlier though, Minister, would it still capture if, if, if the person, if the employee was talking to one of the clients? Minister. Thank you. So I'll kind of go back to our early conversation. So the bill, the purpose of the bill is not to capture that interaction between the patient and clinician or staff member in there. What I said earlier on is though, in certain circumstances, if the the behaviour that you spoke about earlier on, you know, was, was deemed such, that there, there could be action taken under this bill. But noting that the purpose of the bill is not that it is not for that for that reason. The purpose of the bill is for anybody um, you know, seeking to harass, etc., etc., a person who's seeking to access services, or a patient, or, or, or a staff member who's who's entering the clinic for work. So it doesn't preclude the the, the example you gave earlier on. Um, so that if you know, in, in an extreme case, the bill could capture uh, that action. Uh, but that's not the purpose of the bill. And, and, and again, if such an action was to take place, well, there's other complaint mechanisms and other appropriate, um, appropriate places like Hadsco, et cetera, where that complaint could be made. So it's not, it's not explicit. It could, in certain circumstances, be an issue, uh, but that's not what the bill is about. The Honourable Nick Grant. Thanks, Deputy Chair. The, the, if I look at sub clause 2, which defines the type of um, engagement of behaviour that is captured here and considered to be prohibited behaviour. There's essentially five categories. And that's why we've got the sub clauses A through to E. Now the second of those five categories talks about communicating by any means in relation to abortion in a manner that is able to be seen or heard by a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided and reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. Now, in my view, Minister, when you've got a situation when a client attends, decides that they want to change their mind, and as they are trying to leave, they are then told by the people forcefully you have to have it today because today's the last day, which is a 
a general reference to the fact that in Western Australia it'll be under 20 weeks, um, that's causing distress or anxiety and it would reasonably cause distress or anxiety to a person and it's certainly able to be um, seen or heard by a person at seeking to leave the premises and it is communication in relation to an abortion. So that particular scenario is captured by the second of the five categories. My concern is that when we go to subsection three, it seems to provide an immunity with regard to the second category. So I accept that subsection three doesn't provide an immunity with regard to the other four categories. <coughs> so uh, an employee at a clinic uh, who contravenes the law with respect to categories A, C, D and E, and we'll get to E in a minute, um, they would be able to be captured. I, I agree with that assessment, but my, what I want to see clarification on is does subsection 3 provide a complete immunity, a complete immunity to an employee of a clinic in respect to subsection B, that is the second category of offences? Minister. Thank you. So I'm for, I am informed that yes, there is an exemption between a client and clinician in this regard. Now that it's not to say, and that's in this bill, it's not to say that there's other bills where this wouldn't be captured, but in the bill before us it would. The Honourable Nick Gray. <clears throat> Look, I appreciate the clarification, uh, Minister. I, I think it's um, re regrettable, um, but uh, I, I accept that that's the latest um, iteration of the advice that's been provided. Um, can I ask you then to consider the first of the categories, which talks about besets, harasses, intimidates, interferes with, threatens, hinders, obstructs or impedes a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are, are provided. Would that scenario that I've, been, that I've given earlier still be capable of being captured under that first category? Minister. So I'm advised in unique circumstances it could be captured, but the likelihood is that a, a court or indeed the police will go back to the purpose of the bill, and the purpose of the bill quite clearly says what it says, which is to provide safe access zones around premises at which abortions are provided so as to protect the safety and wellbeing, respect the privacy and dignity of persons accessing the services provided at those premises and employees and other persons who need to access those premises in the course of their duties uh, and responsibilities in particular. The Honourable Nick Graham. Yes, um, Minister, you've referred to the purpose a few times by way of explanation. And um, I must say that uh, even if it may not have, this, this type of scenario may not have been thought of by the uh, drafters of the legislation, um, it doesn't mean that it's outside the scope of the purpose because that scenario that I've provided earlier very much is dealing with the safety and well-being of the person. It's very much dealing with the respect of the person and their privacy and dignity. If they want to leave the clinic, if they say, 
I really don't want to do this. I've, I've, I've decided I don't want to go ahead with this. And then they are harassed by a person in the clinic. Then, frankly, that goes right to the heart of this in terms of providing a premises which is supposed to be providing this for the safety and well-being and respect and privacy and dignity of the person accessing the services provided at those premises. <coughs> so I guess my only concern then, uh, Minister, is if a person were to indicate that they no longer want to access the service, they say, no, I want, I want to leave here, I don't want to access the service, are they no longer protected by this legislation? Minister. Thank you. So again, honourable member, so this is, that's not the intention of the bill, but I, I am advised again that in, in such a circumstance as you prescribed, um, such an action could be captured by the bill. Um, while it's not envisaged that, um, that that action would be policed, for want of a better word, or investigated under, under this bill, it could well, and that would be open to the police and indeed the, course, the court to take that course, course of action. The Honourable Nick Grant. Uh, thank you, Minister. It does provide some uh, comfort. I, I still think that uh, it's unnecessary to provide uh, these employees with a partial uh, immunity. And the scenario that's provided in the uh, explanatory memorandum of two employees walking down the path together to talk to, to, talk to one another about their work, um, I, I think that with respect to those who have <coughs> drafted that in the explanatory memorandum, they really have missed the point of the objective test, because the objective test says reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. And I can't think of any judicial officer who is going to objectively say that two employees walking down the path towards their, their mutual place of employment, uh, talking about their work, could objectively be said to reason be reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. So I actually think, <coughs> respectfully, that it's a, poor, it's a very poor example, um, and it's actually the only example that's provided in the explanatory memorandum as to why subclause 3 is justified. That's 202 capital P subclause 3. <coughs> I am um, at least comforted by the fact that that immunity that's being provided to the employees is limited to only the second of the five categories, then it doesn't, it doesn't provide an immunity with respect to the first category in particular, which deals with harassment, intimidation and, and the like. Now, uh, Minister, I'd like to take you to the fifth of the categories, which I'd like to take you to the fifth of the categories, which, which is uh, set out at uh, 202 capital P subsection 2E. There it talks about engaging in any other behaviour prescribed by the regulations for the purposes of this paragraph. Minister. Chair, I'm struggling to hear the and he's sitting facing me. So I would ask you to remind honourable members that if they have conversations to be had, they do it quietly or they take them outside so we can actually progress this debate. Thank you, Minister. If I could just, just remind our honourable members to take their private conversations outside, that would be appreciated. 
The Honourable Nick Gurran. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Thank you, Minister. Um, so my question is in regards to the fifth of the categories that define uh, prohibited behaviour, and it's set out at uh, clause or proposed section 202, capital P, sub section 2E, where it says engaging in any other behaviour prescribed by the regulations for the purposes of this paragraph. And my question is, what is the behaviour that is intended to be prescribed in the regulations? Minister. Thank you. So I think, Honourable Member, I'd seem to recall we've had conversations on similar provisions and other pieces of legislation uh, previously. Um, set, so the regulations are not required to support the bill. Uh, how, however, or nevertheless, Section 202, Big P, 2E of the bill allows the Minister for Health to prescribe by regulations any other behaviour that might be prohibited in a safe access zone. This would ensure that the government can be responsive to any unforeseen behaviour that might affect women and staff accessing premises of which abortions are provided in the future. The Honourable Nick Curran. Um, so, um, in other words, Minister, I'm happy to take a binding suggestion. It's not presently the intention of the government to prescribe any regulations. It's not. Um, well, I mean, for the sake of the record, although I'm certainly on the record of having said it on previous bills, I find that unnecessary and it would be desirable to, to delete it, but I won't be uh, moving an amendment. To I think effect. I've told you in previous pieces of legislation this is about sort of like it's about future proofing, I think. And you yes. at that time also indicated that you didn't think it was My lack of enthusiasm for, for such things, especially when we're talking about trying to uh, regulate the behaviour of uh, individuals. Um, around uh, locations and zones which they may not even know exist because a list of the, uh, of the locations might not be publicly available. But nevertheless, I, I take comfort in the fact that it's not the present intention of the government uh, to regulate uh, anything in this, re in this respect. That said, things do change quickly, as you know, Minister, because, of course, it was also the position of the government uh, on a different matter, not to proceed with any electoral reform, and no sooner did the election happen, we suddenly had a change of heart. So, governments of different persuasions can certainly change their views on things quite quickly. Entirely to engage with you on that issue and to take you on the course. Sure. Thank members. you. So, um, uh, Deputy Chair, uh, through you to, to, to the Minister, uh, what I'd like to do really, I guess, in terms of rounding out the clause uh, for uh, discussion uh, is just really to deal with two, two final things. Uh, I say two final things, not necessarily because they'll be super speedy, but uh, there are two, two more themes that need to be addressed. Uh, one is dealing with the uh, offence regarding uh, recording, and the other is to just take you through a few examples of what might occur. Now, with regard to the recording offence, that's 202Q. It's, it's, it's intended to make it an offence to publish or distribute a recording. Uh, is there any evidence that this type of uh, behaviour uh, has occurred in Western Australia before?
Minister. Thank you. So I'm going to answer this in a couple of ways, Honourable Member. So the purpose of the offence, the offence will prevent anti abortion groups or others from seeking to shame, stigmatise, humiliate or cause distress to women by publishing images of them accessing abortion clinics online. Um, this offence might not capture media depending on the circumstances and where there will generally be a reasonable excuse for publishing recordings. We are aware of instances of women being filmed entering these clinics and those images being published on social media sites. So I have not seen any evidence of it in Western Australia. However, uh, in the submission, so in, I draw your attention to the Safe Access Zones, a proposal for reform in Western Australia report 2020, page seven, uh, pages 33 and 34, the consultation responses received. Uh, on page 34, um, there was um, submissions received that the definition should expressly uh, prohibit photography and its publication and distribution, including online or over social media. So 16 people submitted that. We are, however, aware of, um, of people being recorded in other jurisdictions. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, uh, it was decided to include this provision in our bill. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Chair and Minister. Look, I've, I've got no problem with it being included. I can't understand why any uh, fair-minded individual would want to be uh, taking such recordings, let alone publishing or distributing them. Um, I'm heartened to hear that there doesn't appear to be any evidence of it having happened in Western Australia. If this uh, 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 discourages anyone from uh, undertaking the type of behaviour that has occurred in, in other jurisdictions, then that's a good thing. Uh, that said, Minister, can you just explain um, why uh, proposed section 202Q, the offence there, to publish and distribute the recording uh, is needed. Why is that needed in light of 202P2D? Minister. Thank you. So the difference of so 202 big P 2D um, talks about the recording. What 202 big Q talks about is, is the next step, the publishing and the distribution of that, of that material that was recorded. Thank you, Deputy Chair. So Minister, at 202 P 2D, if it said, without reasonable excuse, makes a recording by any means, or publishes or distributes that recording of any another person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided without the other person's consent, if it said that, and I recognise it doesn't, then arguably 202Q might not be necessary. Thank you. Uh, so it's, it's a bit more than that. So um, 202 PQ talks about the recording. 202, did I say 202 PQ? I meant 202 PD. You know what I'm talking about. 2D talks about the recording. Um, 202 Q talks about so the, the publishing and distribution. Um, so so the, 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 the main point, so without consent, without reasonable excuse, and if the recording contains particulars that are likely to lead to the identification of the other person and the other person as a person ac accessing premises at which abortions are provided. So it's a bit broader than what you've just suggested. Um, they're two different issues and the advice is that they needed two different, uh, there needed to be two different offence provisions in the bill. 
Honourable Nick Graham. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I suspect it will never get used, but um, ne nevertheless, I do, I do note uh, there, Minister, that it says in 202Q, it refers to particulars that are likely to lead to the identification of, and then it refers to two categories, and, and it uses the word and. So the the, pub, the recording needs to contain particulars of both of these categories, the identification of both of these categories. One is the other person. So we can, if we think that, take this through as uh, somebody's taking a recording of another person who has been accessing a clinic. That's what's being referred to there. But then it goes in on B and says, and B, the other person as a person accessing premises at which abortions are provided. It's, it's, not, apparent, it's not apparent to me what, what is the difference between A and B. Minister. So it is a drafting issue, but essentially uh, a recording that might unintentionally capture a woman in the background who might be walking along the street towards an abortion clinic um, isn't likely to be captured by the offence under this bill, unless, for example, those who have taken the video specifically describe her as someone who is heading towards an abortion clinic to undergo an abortion. So it needs to be, you know, it needs to meet the threshold of, of a person who's likely to be going towards it, but and then it's also that. Um, that extra bit that they are accessing premises at which abortions are provided to. So they need to be in two, to make it clear, need it to be in two lines. Nick Graham. I think I understand, Minister. I think what, what you're saying then is that uh, when they are publishing or uh, distributing this recording, it will have been an offence if they have identified the person, so that's the first thing, person X. But then they also, they can't, they can't just be limited to that. In addition to that, identifying person X, they must then go further and also say, and person X was a person accessing the premises. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that's uh, sufficiently clear. It is uh, in intriguing uh, drafting, but uh, nevertheless, as I say, I think it's gonna be a provision that is unlikely to get used, and I take comfort in the fact that it's not uh, seen to be a problem in Western Australia at this time. Now, um, Minister, uh, the, my, the last theme I want to take us through with respect to Clause uh, 4 is really to look at the type of uh, conduct that may or may not um, then be captured uh, by the, for the purposes of this bill, because there are fair-minded people, there are fair-minded people who <coughs> um, support this bill and say that the, the categories that the categories should should be um, included. And as I said, there are five categories of prohibited behaviour here. And I've, I've got no problem, I do, have a, I do have a problem with the fifth category because it's un, it is unspecified. It's left, to, it's left to the government of the day, one, at one point in time, to suddenly cr uh, draft new behaviour that's, that's going to be captured. So I, I do have a problem with the fifth category. If we look at the fourth category, that's what we've just discussed, which is the recording of people entering uh, or leaving the premises, I see no need for any Western Australian to have the, the right to be able to record a person in those circumstances. I have no problem with that being an offence. 
If I look at the third category, it talks about a person without reasonable ex excuse interfering with or impeding a footpath, road or vehicle in relation to an abortion. Again, I've got no problem with that because I go back to my comments that I made in my second reading speech and as a matter of principle, I believe that every Western Australian should be able to go about their lawful business unimpeded by others. It's one of the reasons why I supported the legislation that was brought in under the Barnett government, <coughs> which was strongly opposed, strongly opposed at the time, um, uh, which, which would have seen that type of uh, behaviour uh, prohibited. Uh, there is no good reason, in my view, for a person, a Western Australian, to be interfered with or to have their path or the road or a vehicle uh, impeded. As it so happens, this is just restricted to abortion clinics. I see no reason why it shouldn't apply across the board. Nevertheless, it's not an offence uh, that I oppose. And if we go to the first category, Minister, we're then talking about people who beset, harass, intimidate, interfere with, threaten, hinder, obstruct or impede a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving a premises which an abortion is taking place. So for the same reasons, I don't have a difficulty with that. People shouldn't be harassed. People shouldn't be obstructed. They shouldn't be impeded. They shouldn't be hindered. They shouldn't be threatened. They shouldn't be beset upon. These are all the types of issues which I think have attracted a lot of support by fair-minded individuals, including in this chamber. However, then we've got this other category, Minister, which talks about communication by any means. Now, it's the phrase, by any means, that causes concern to some other fair-minded Western Australians who are only interested in providing care and, com and compassion and support for people who are inclined to change their mind. And you'll see there that it talks about that communication by any means, being able to be seen or heard by a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving the premises at which abortions are provided. And it's reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. So in a sense, Minister, <coughs> it will perhaps shock some uh, uh, members maybe inside and outside of the chamber, but in the absence of Clause 202P2B uh, and E, there'd be every likelihood I'd support the bill. <laughs> but this, these two provisions remain, and, and we know full well that they will remain as this bill completes its passage through the chamber. What I want to provide some assurance to people outside the chamber of is exactly the type of conduct that will be captured by this particular provision, that is 202P2B. So if I can give you one example, uh, Minister. So let's take, for example, uh, protest. Now, I want to make it very clear at this point, before I continue with the example, that just because I provide an example doesn't necessarily mean that I support the action. The purpose of me asking the, the question is to identify what type of conduct will be captured by these offences or not. So I want to take the example of a protest. So, Minister, if somebody was protesting in the ordinary sense of the word, that means that if you're... If you're I'm talking about a vocal protest, because there is such a thing as a silent protest, a vocal protest that might include signage and it might not. It might include signage uh, I mean, in the sense of a core flute on a stake. It might include signage on a person's uh, T-shirt. Um, and it might be a vocal protest in the sense of people might be expressing a particular view. Would that type of vocal protest, as I've defined, uh, be captured by the bill?
Minister. OK. I think you're going to have a few questions on this issue, so I'm going to just play something on the record at the outset. So in terms of the specific tests that are, that are part of subsection 2P, uh, 2 big P, 2B, so communication by any means in relation to abortion in a manner that is able to be seen or heard and a verbal communication will clearly fall into that category. To a person seeking to access an abortion clinic will be caught by this provision only if it is reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. So this is an objective test that will be assessed by WA Police upon receiving a complaint taking into account a particular circumstance. So if there was a protest outside such a, such a facility and the person seeking to access it was, was made to feel anxious or felt anxious or it caused them distress, then it would be captured. Um, Just to clarify that final comment, though, Minister, it's not if the person felt anxious or was made to feel anxious, because that would then be a subjective test. So it, it would be if the courts if determined that objectively the, um, the person vocalising their protest or having the sign or having the T-shirt with some form of communication on it, um, that the, the court said that that objectively causes distress and anxiety, then it would be captured. Yep. So I think that's helpful. Now, Minister, what about if it's a silent protest? So, um, and, and perhaps if you can take us through two, two scenarios there. There's a silent protest where there is no signage and there is a silent protest uh, uh, with signage. Uh, would there be a difference there and would it be captured by the bill? Minister. Thank you. So the bill, the bill isn't framed. Uh, the bill does not expressly prohibit like a silent vision, a vigil uh, in a safe access zone, but it has been framed to prohibit communication about, abort about abortions within a safe access zone if that communication is a able to be seen or heard by a person entering or leaving premises providing abortions, and b is reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. Now, again, that last element is an objective test that would ultimately be determined by the police and the court, depending on the circumstances of the case. The question of whether certain behaviours, such as praying or holding a silent vigil within a safe access zone, uh, would constitute an offence would depend on the circumstance. Um, the High Court decision did not expressly address whether the law in Victoria extends to silent prayers. However, the majority stated that silent but reproachful observance of persons accessing a clinic, clinic for the purpose of, deter, of terminating a pregnancy may be as effective as a means of deterring them from doing so as more boisterous demonstrations. And so this suggests that the prohibition can extend to silent activities such as prayer. So, um, to, be, to be clear then, Minister, um, if the police were inclined to um, proceed with a prosecution <clears throat> under 202B, 202P, subsection 2B, with regard to um, a silent protest, because so, we're talking about silent protests here, we've already dealt with the vocal protests. The, the police would need to uh, have confidence that they would be able to convince a court that the conduct, which is silent, um, is objectively reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. <clears throat> now, if that's the case, uh, Minister, I'll just make some comments because I think at the end of the day where we're at is no one knows until it gets tested in the courts. But if a person is, is standing there silently uh, with placards, um, with placards 
uh, I suspect that that is going to be assessed as being objectively reasonably likely to cause distress and anxiety. Of course, it depends what's on the placard. And if the placard, if the, if, uh, I think there was some suggestion in some quarters uh, <clears throat> that there was distress and anxiety uh, caused because somebody had been called a murderer. Well, that would cause stress and anxiety, and object that would be both objective and subjective. Um, but if if the person was communicating, and I, I know I'm now reverting back to the um, to vocal communication, if the person um, uh, doesn't say anything. So the scenario here, Minister, is that a person is at the front of a clinic, they're within the 150 metre zone, they don't say anything, they haven't <coughs> got any placards and they haven't got any signage on their, on their person, including on their T-shirt, etc. They're approached by a person who is looking to enter into a clinic and they have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So they're communicating by any means, Just by any means. Along the lines of what I described at the end of my second reading speech, where a conversation took place between two ladies, and at the end of that conversation, the lady who was going to walk into the clinic said uh, to the other one, let's go and grab a cup of coffee. And then the person never returned again. And now there's a Western Australian born as a result of that particular incident. That was the case study that I read in last, last night. Um, in that situation, can we have some degree of confidence, Minister, that that will not be captured by this legislation? Minister. Thank you. So this bill is about um, influence, influencing people who are trying to stop somebody from from um, from accessing an abortion clinic. In that in that circumstance that you gave, I, I, I you know I, I would struggle to see police taking action in that regard. However, subsequently, for example, if that person who who has taken who you know who's had had a child and you know down the track feels that they feels anxious or distressed or whatever, you know, potentially there could be a potential Well, issue. except that at that point it would then be subjective, so we're it going back be. to the objective it test. But it's a, yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't imagine that, you know, it, it would be up to police, but I couldn't imagine that action happening. Honourable Nick Graham. All right, well, look, I mean, that, that does provide a lot of comfort, I have to say, um, Minister, if, if, if that's the case. Um, uh, uh, are the police, and, and I know you've got health advisers here, but hopefully there's been some communication with, with police. It, 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 are the police um, preparing any guidelines for their officers uh, as to, uh, to direct or to provide uh, some guidance to them as to the, how they intend to prosecute these type of offences? You've helpfully indicated to us that, at least initially, the intention is to uh, educate people uh, particularly where the conduct is, is, is uh, not outrageous conduct. Obviously, if it's outrageous conduct, which meets uh, hindering and threatening and intimidating and so forth, then, of course, I have every um, confidence that police will throw the book at such individuals. But where the uh, behaviour is not like that, uh, but it might still infringe upon these laws that the, uh, it is the intention of police to take a bit more of an educative type of a role, um, that is something that, that I support. There's going to be information provided and so forth. There's still the capacity, I think you've indicated, for move-on notices to also be provided. I think that's very helpful. In fact, that's something that I would encourage the police to use at first instance if they really feel concerned that there's an issue here. Um, rather, and I would like to think, incidentally, Minister, that police would go down this path because the sheer cost to police and to the taxpayer of proceeding with a prosecution under 202p 
the time invested in that, both with the police and the courts, far outweighs anything that could be achieved by way of a, mo a move on order. But nevertheless, the question is, is some form of guidance being prepared? Minister. Mr. Chair, uh, so yes, the, the police, WA Police have established a safe access zone working group, which is currently developing guidance material for police officers to educate and inform them of the new provisions uh, and developing a policy. Mick Graham. Thanks, uh, Deputy Chair and, and Minister. Uh, uh, that's encouraging to hear. It'll be interesting to, to find out uh, what the outcomes are of that particular uh, working group. Um, I do note that it sounds to be a work in progress, and yet this law is going to be imminent. So again, this, this is more of a comment than, than a question. But it would again seem to suggest that it is appropriate at first instance for uh, police not to take a heavy-handed approach to this given that they themselves are still working out the <coughs> internal mechanisms as to how they're going to be uh, handling the enforcement uh, of, of these laws. Um, Minister, I just want to uh, provide one final um, uh, example, and that is the supplying of information. So uh, this would be in the form of um, a publication, um, so maybe a brochure, uh, as you are aware, and I think that uh, you indicated uh, earlier, uh, there is a keenness and the West Australian Women's Health and Wellbeing Policy uh, <coughs> for um, there to be enhanced reproductive choices and services for women, including contraceptive options, unplanned pregnancy counselling programs, ultrasound and medical and surgical termination of pregnancy. Now, if the brochure that's being provided to a person approaching a clinic within the 150 metres is a brochure offering unplanned pregnancy counselling program, would the, would, the, would the distribution of that brochure uh, be an infraction on 202p? Minister. Thank you. So it's unlikely that handing out brochures without any connection to abortion would be disallowed, um, unless the behaviour itself is covered by the other prohibited behaviours such as harassment, obstruction or interference with a person accessing premises at which abortions are provided. If it does mention abortion, it would likely be captured by this. Okay. Yep. Honourable Nick Graham. So in other words, Minister, if there's a, um, a thank you for the um, uh, transparent um, and authentic advice. Um, I, I, I take that then, that if there is a brochure that is limited, it is limited to unplanned pregnancy counselling programs. It's not mentioning terminations, it's not mentioning abortions. It's simply saying, and it may be as simple as saying, um, do, you want, do you want me to journey with you at this time? as you um, continue with your um, pregnancy. Never mentions abortion. Uh, that type of a, of, a, of a publication, it would be difficult, uh, it sounds, for that to be subjected to this offence provision. Um, if that is indeed the case, I think that is good. I think that is fair. I think that is compassionate. I think that that addresses the, the, the major concern the primary concern of those people who I have had interacted with who do go to the clinics. Now, I accept that it might not be for all of them, but the vast majority of them are motivated by a desire to journey with people who feel like they have no other choice. They want to address the situation where the boyfriend drives the girlfriend to the clinic. The boyfriend, uh, with no courage whatsoever, sits in the car and waits and sends his girlfriend in and she has to journey alone. And she actually doesn't want to be there. And they are there 
with a pamphlet saying, I'll journey with you. And as we know from the example I gave yesterday, what can happen is one conversation leads to a cup of coffee afterwards and a, and a new West Australian is born as a result of it <clears throat> and is able to testify accordingly. If that's the type of situation that we're now saying is not going to be captured by this, by this bill, uh, I welcome that. I accept, Minister, that at the end of the day, <clears throat> and I know we're keen to, to resolve things in the next few minutes, um, at the end of the day, this is something that will have to be tested by the courts, particularly with respect to this phrase, reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. But the courts will have the benefit of our dialogue today, including the fact that it needs to be an objective test. Minister. Oh, yep, um, that was a comment, I understand. Um, so, uh, members, the question is that Clause 4 stand as printed. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those to contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is that Clause 5 stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Graham. One question, Minister. There is a difference here with respect to the 2020 bill and the 2021 bill, if you can just explain that. Minister. So there is a difference here, honourable member. Um, so I did, I have referred to it previously in the debate. Uh, I think it was in my second reading reply, where I spoke about um, there's a difference in terms of the drafting that was suggested by PCO at the time the original bill was uh, was drafted, and the second time it was drafted. And originally, uh, in, the, in the former bill, uh, there was provisions for a document to be tabled outside of a sitting period within a specified period of time if Parliament wasn't going to be sitting. Uh, PCO have changed. Uh, PCO have given different advice this time and this is what it stands at now. Members, the question is that Clause 5 stand as printed. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is that the title of the bill be Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zone Bill 2021. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those to the contrary say no. The question is that I report the bill to the House. All of those of that opinion say aye. 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 All of those to the contrary say no. And the ayes have it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, President, I have to report that the Committee of the Whole House has considered the bill Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zone Bill 2021 and agreed to the same without amendment. Minister. Uh, I move the report be adopted. The question is the report be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Third reading. Be read a third time. Uh, I'm going to be read a third time. Uh, I have received from the deputy chair of committees a certificate in writing. Um, that is the true copy of the bill as agreed to in committee of the whole house and reported. And the question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. The honourable Nick Guerin. Mm, thank you, President. Uh, I rise to uh, speak at the third reading of the uh, Public Health Amendment uh, Bill of 2021. And at the outset, um, <coughs> President, I want to... Um... Uh, Honourable Member, uh, it's my duty to interrupt you at the commencement of your contribution to uh, now move to members' statements. Are there any members' statements? President. The Honourable um, Colin de Grassa. Thank you. President, and I rise tonight to um, bring to the attention of government, to members of the public, uh, an appalling set of circumstances involving Miss Bronte Glass, who joins us in the public gallery tonight. Bronte is a survivor of that most unimaginable and heinous of crimes, child sexual abuse. And I've read the very detailed and incredibly disturbing documentation that Bronte provided me, and it was incredibly disturbing and, uh, and very, very difficult. And I cannot imagine what she and other survivors have been through 
and how challenging it is for them to actually come forward and relive some of those awful and dark times. So members may wonder why I'm talking about Bronte's story here today. These events occurred many years ago in the 1970s and 1980s, a period during which Bronte was a ward of the state. They aren't recent occurrences, but they are a part of Bronte's life, and sadly for many other survivors are a similar story of abuse, neglect and systemic failures of multiple agencies. But I'm not here to talk about those failures which led to the abuse and which Bronte suffered, but to the failures of those agencies to adequately address those problems through the redress process. I want to talk more specifically about the appalling and disgraceful failure of current agencies in relation to Bronte's case. To do that, I'll provide an overview of her situation, and I'm sure members will agree that what has happened to Bronte on her journey through the redress scheme should not happen to anyone, and that is why I speak on this issue today, so that others don't have to endure the disgraceful treatment Bronte has had to endure in the past year or so. So Bronte participated in the state government's Redress WA scheme and was awarded an ex gratia payment through that process. This was acknowledged in a letter from the then Premier, Colin Barnett at the time. Subsequent to this process, of course, the National Redress Scheme was established and Bronte made an application to that scheme in 2019. I'm not going to read through that application. As I said, uh, the details are, are harrowing. Uh, they are unimaginable uh, abuses that no one should have to to suffer and something that I certainly can't comprehend. Bronte's application to the National Redress Scheme was, scheme was successful and on the 4th of May 2020 she was advised of an offer from the Redress Scheme, scheme and the letter gave her several options and those options are... Uh, so the letter to Bronte says there are three ways in which you can respond to this, off this offer. One, you can accept one, two or all three parts of the offer. Two, you can ask for a review of the offer. Or three, you can decline the offer. You must notify the scheme by 6 October 2020 of your decision. Bronte subsequently accepted all three parts of the offer. Uh, and those components were uh, set out in a letter to Bronte on the 14th of April 2020, which says your offer of redress is a redress payment of X as acknowledged as acknowledgement of the wrong you experienced, access to a counselling and psychological payment of X, and thirdly, access to a direct personal response on behalf of the Department of Communities. You can accept one, two, or all three of the components of redress. Now, Bronte accepted all three components of the redress, and it is the third component, it is the third component that I want to focus my remarks on tonight, and that is access to a direct personal response on behalf of the Department of Communities. So in relation to this, Bronte requested a written and verbal apology from the Department of Communities. Now I have here a very detailed document which Bronte has provided me, um, which is unfortunately a letter of complaint to the National Redress Scheme about the failures of the various agencies to deliver that direct personal response appropriately. And so I'm going to outline some of the key aspects through the timeline. I'm not going to read everything that's in this document, obviously, uh, but I want to go through some of the key issues here. So 21st of October 2020, Bronte receives a phone, ca phone call from one of the... Uh, a, a staffer in the Department of Justice and Victims of Crime. Uh, and she states that when I applied to the National Redress Scheme, I requested a written and Virgil apo verbal apology from the Department of Community Services, Western Australia. On the 21st of October 2020, person X from the Office of the Commissioner, Commissioner for Victims of Crime called me and arranged the time to deliver my apology. On the 9th of November 2020, a meeting uh, was set up in which that apparently was going to be delivered. During this meeting, um, one of the particular staff there was uh, quite um, invasive in asking questions about Bronte's application and for the details of that application, which was not obviously the point of this particular meeting. Um, so there were questions about um, what 
she had to basically relive her, her, her story of abuse, which is unacceptable. At one point, this person also said, you should be happy with your redress money. That is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. This is not and never, never has been about money. Uh, and it was about a, a reasonable re apology and response from the appropriate department. The other issue, of course, is that it was the Department of Justice that Bronte was sitting in front of. And she was advised by a staffer at this office that written apologies are just generic letters stamped by the Department of Justice and they're not from the institution responsible for the abuse. And that's at that point, obviously, that Bronte realised that she wasn't actually going to get an apology from the Department of Communities, despite that being what she requested and accepted. Uh, and obviously, that has had a profound impact on Bronte uh, since then. And there are a number of other issues that she has had to endure throughout this process, uh, which has still not been resolved. In the end, Bronte had to seek support of Relationships Australia to uh, um, move forward with this complaint process. Uh, and I just want to go through some of the impacts here that Bronte has, uh, has provided. The way I was treated by victims of crime has re-traumatised re me. What I went through is more than I've been through in 20 years. I can't stop thinking about the way I was treated. It's always in my head. I had no choice or power to make decisions. I was continually ignored when I raised concerns about the conduct of VRC staff. My voice was silent. It's really made me feel helpless. It's like I've been raped all over again. No one cared. I thought I was done with fighting for my right to be heard and for the abuse to be acknowledged, but instead I got caught in a web between these people. I shouldn't have to fight to be treated with respect and I shouldn't have to fight for my apology. If any of the old people that go through redress have to put up with this, it will kill them. I don't want anybody to go through what I experience. I just want people to be accountable for their actions. And I don't think that's too much to ask for. I don't think it's too much to ask that these departments deliver uh, such a direct personal response, i.e. apology, with empathy and that, the, uh, that they have appropriately trained and um, skilled staff in order to do that. And this really is an indictment on those, those uh, departments and ultimately their ministers uh, that such uh, a profoundly important process as this, such a profoundly important process as this, appears to be nothing more than a box ticking exercise with no genuine concern, no genuine concern for what survivors have been through. Uh, and so in particular two people in that department, I am not going to name them here. Uh, I, I, think, I think I could, but I don't think that's fair. I think the uh, minister will be well aware of the people involved in this particular case. And I am what I would like to see on behalf of Bronte is that the relevant ministers, that is the Attorney-General and the Minister for Communities in particular, uh, actually hear from Bronte, actually understand what she has been through and fix the mess so that no one else has to go through this. No one should have to go through what Bronte has been through. And so I call on those ministers to meet with her as soon as possible to address the issues she has raised and make sure that uh, this apology process, this direct personal response process is fit for purpose and that the right people are actually delivering those, um, those direct personal responses. President. Uh, the Honourable Sophia Mamon. President. So, um, as a person, and this may come as a surprise to some people, I'm quite non-judgmental. No. Make yourself happy, believe what you want, as long as this doesn't impinge on, impinge on the rights of others. I do, have, however, have an issue with two particular quirks. One is wastefulness and the other one is willful ignorance. Recently, though, false equivalences and the use of ad hominems have also come onto my ra radar. However, I want to focus on willful ignorance here. Willful ignorance in a time where excess to information is the easiest it has ever been, is embarrassing at best, and in the case of the creation of legislation that has real life consequences for people, is negligent at worst. One of these areas where willful ignorance appears to have formed the basis of legislation by this government and other governments is the criminalisation of cannabis use. 
The fact that cannabis is included in the Poisons Act is a clear example of that. Cannabis has not ever killed anyone. It doesn't belong there, and whom, whomever placed it there was willfully ignorant. The fact that there are at least 425 studies showing efficacy, yet pain clinics in WA, in major hospitals, um, instead of giving their patients a choice, funnel people towards, towards opiates, uh, NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, paracetamol and other drugs like Lyrica to manage symptoms of pain. So opiates are addictive. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have a whole range of side effects, side effects as well. Uh, paracetamol causes liver uh, failure, and you will find in hospitals people waiting for liver transplants uh, due to paracetamol use. So, yet doctors specialising in the management of pain refuse, point blank refuse, to recommend CBD oil. So the only logical reason of why that is, is willful ignorance. The science supports the use of cannabis for many conditions, and people should have the right to choose their medicine. So I know when my dad went through ke uh, chemotherapy, he was very, very unwell with that. He had nausea, he lost a lot of weight, um, and as I've referenced prior, it was 30 years ago, that I saw the benefits of c uh, cannabis for nausea during chemotherapy. Now, I, I did try to find some numbers in regards to the amount of people that have had chemotherapy over the last 30 years or so. I haven't got any precise figures, but it is in the millions. So imagine the suffering that would have been prevented if all those people would have been offered the option of cannabis to manage their nausea and pain. So when this willful ignorance leads to an increase in suffering, when a belief system with no basis in science or fact prolongs the suffering of people or actively contributes to it, when activism actively blo blocks access to a substance that can reduce suffering, that is the type of willful ignorance that I find incredibly offensive. The cannabis is a herbal medicine. It's not addictive. Some people use it for recreational purposes and has the way, same way people might use alcohol, yet it is much less damaging. It can be grown in much the same way as other medicinal herbs, making it accessible for those who do not have the funds to buy from a pharmacy. When you have the tools to reduce suffering, but you actively choose not to, where's your humanity? Where's your compassion? And where's your empathy? And where's your desire to create, create a fairer, safer, and healthier society? Thank you. Thank you, President. Look, I rise tonight just to raise the issue of a very serious oil spill that's happened at Kirkulocka Station, which is just south of Mount Magnet in my uh, region, in the region of Mining Pastoral, and also in the uh, electorate of North West Central. Uh, the, the situation, uh, and we have been, and my office has been in touch with uh, Blair Allen and Jared Ridley, the owners of the station, and, and obviously they're deeply upset. Uh, I know the Honourable Vince Catania has also been in touch with them, and, 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 and directly so, uh, just to really understand the situation and, and hear from them. Uh, furthermore, I have uh, spoken to, to the office of Amber J. Sanderson today uh, to, to really uh, just see if we can, the Honourable and Jay Sanderson, to see if we can, um, yeah, what is go going on and, 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 and uh, the, her chief of staff has contacted me, uh, which I appreciate, and uh, said there will be further material come back uh, as to the progress of this cleanup. But I think it's a very important thing just for the, the House to be aware of because uh, the North West Highway, which um, is a, our, one of our main um, transport routes through to uh, the Pilbara and, and beyond up to where I live in the Kimberley uh, has become a very uh, very key road for a lot of industrial related transport and, and the transport of uh, toxic uh, material and including uh, also the um, fuels. 
And, uh, the numbers are at the moment there's uh, approximately 800 uh, movements of, of vehicles per day. 42 per cent of those are, are, um, are trucks. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hugely important route. But what's happened in, in, on the 31st of July, a, a truck carrying 33,000 litres of oil uh, has uh, rolled over and of that 28,000 litres, a considerable spill has occurred. And because of the recent rains that we've had in the region, uh, the creeks are moving and, and, and very unfortunately, uh, according to the owners of the station, uh, it wasn't until five days afterwards that the uh, uh, members or officers from uh, the department, Dewar, uh, were actually present on the site and that, that was their report. Uh, and it would appear that the oil has now travelled, uh, if not hundreds, uh, as I'm talking of, of a, a considerable distance, hundreds of kilometres uh, down the creek line. And uh, it's very upsetting for the, for the station owners and, and no doubt will be extremely upsetting for the whole community because of the flora and fauna, that, uh, particularly the fauna that is going to be impacted by this terrible oil spill. From Reports that I have so far, um, the the, um, the company that's responsible, and I, I don't have the name in front of me right here. Um, uh, I think it's Ren Oil. I think actually I will add to the hands up. Ren Oil uh, has um, has removed uh, 8,000 litres, uh, but there seems to be a lot more oil in the system, and it's continuing to spread. So there was uh, concerns raised, and it's, it is on Facebook. You can go on Facebook and see. Uh, some very uh, moving videos of, um, made by Blair herself, who, who's presented uh, the issue and the small turtles that have been, um, been cleaned. But obviously this is one of these situations where the problem is so great, it's beyond the capacity of, of people in, on that station. And, and uh, the responsibility, I understand, is with, is with the company to resolve the matter. Now, I think this really does raise a number of questions which I will be pursuing. Uh, with respect to the to 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 the minister, to really to understand uh, how this sort of thing can be avoided in the future, um, we we all understand of the there's this vast state that we have we have um, a situation where apparently it's taken five days for for a response team to get up there and start doing some work, um, and in that time this oil has spread. Um, I, I do uh, challenge the, the members of the House here, if, if that were to happen in Perth, how long that would take. I don't think it would be five days. And it isn't that far really up the road. It, it shouldn't take that long. And, and that is something, without, without criticising, without knowing the facts fully, I, I think it's worthy of further investigation. And I think really what needs to be the sorts of issues that I will be raising on behalf of the pastorals uh, the, 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 uh, in that region and, and the people of our uh, my community in the in the mining and pastoral region is really what what how do we op do this sort of thing in the future? Uh, what are the emergency management plans, uh, and what are the KPIs in relation to responding to situations like this? Because increasingly we can see there's been a massive increase if you go onto the the main roads traffic map uh, um, data tool, which is an excellent tool for those uh, members seeking to understand transport tasks across Western Australia. Uh, you can see all the data there, but, but over the last uh, 12 months there's been a massive increase, obviously related to the mining uh, boom that's occurring in the north at the moment, uh, in, in the movement of vehicles uh, in, in the region. And, and, and I uh, have seen that firsthand as I've driven uh, probably 50,000 kilometres over the last 12 months across the region, seeing you know, the, 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 just a huge amount of transport that's moving on the roads. Um, do we have uh, proper emergency management plans? Who is actually responsible? Uh, when landowners have these situations arise, uh, who should they call? How should they deal with it to get a, get a proper response? And, um, and also then the challenge of uh, how, how's this, how are the landowners going to be uh, compensated for anything that may affect their livelihood, their cattle, uh, the, the, the environment? Uh, and you know, how can we be sure that the environment is going to be properly uh, restored to its, its uh, near pristine condition in that part of the world. So, so I, I do um, you know, pass on my thoughts to uh, Blair and Jared. I think uh, they're in a very difficult situation. I, I do hear their, 
their, their, their emotion and, and, their, and their, in what they've said to uh, one of my staff members that spoke to them today directly. And I, 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 I do um, see, you can see it online where they're calling. We're madly speaking to every person and department. We can try, try to and make sure that we can do our best, the best we can in this beautiful landscape. That's a comment they've made. Um, you know, they're, they're just looking for help. They're calling out on help. So I do impress upon my colleagues here today, if you would just uh, pause and have a look on, online, just um, have a look under Facebook, uh, Kirk, Kirkalocker Station. It's, uh, it's easy to find. You'll see the situation. I think it's really, um, I'm really hopeful uh, that the minister is going to take some very uh, stern and, and strong action to, to see what we can do to resolve this issue. So uh, that was my report tonight. Thank you. Members, are there any further member statements? The House is adjourned.